Good afternoon, Othering and Belonging Conference. Na 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 na. We are in Oakland, California. Oakland, California. I welcome you from, I like walked here from the house in which I grew up to welcome you to my city of Oakland, California. Othering and Belonging Conference. Get lit, get lit, get lit, get lit, get lit. It's so exciting. You are at a family reunion. You are loved unconditionally. You are affirmed. You belong here. What a radical invitation to be welcomed as you are in your body with all your superpowers and all your insecurities. You are wanted here. We could not imagine this moment without you specifically, and you, and you as well, and you way in the back. We could not do this without you here, so what a jubilation. Celebrate belonging right now. That was a very tepid celebration of belonging. I'm talking about all of the borders you crossed to get here. Everything your ancestors sacrificed to, for you to belong in this room right now. I'm saying ain't nobody in the world who can say you don't mean to be here right now. And what a radical act that is in 2019. What a radical act it is on this planet to say all of our minds belong in this room in these rooms, in these conversations we're about to embark in boldly, boldly saying we love each other. We love ourselves and we love each other. We love ourselves, we love each other, and we love the work we are commanded to do. Y'all ain't here with me? Okay. I missed you. I did. I missed being in this space with you. Even if we haven't met, you are missed. There have been so many times you've been tried to be silenced, and I want to hear your voice today. We need to hear your voice all the next three days. So welcome again to Othering and Belonging 2019. Thank you to the organizers of this space, to John Powell and the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Yes. I want to take my, my time when I say that. Fair and inclusive society, that's a big dream that we are capable of bringing into fruition fair and inclusive society. This is a place of belonging. And here we take care of each other. We listen, we support each other, we create belonging. This is a dynamic space. And belonging is about co-creating something together, the world we wish to see. This is a place of engagement that means we stay open. We challenge ourselves to grow and engage even when it is hard. So I'm asking y'all today, are you here to do the good work with us? The overachievers in the front three rows, yes. I can tell they're here with us. Y'all gonna keep chanting because y'all doing the good work. But in the back, are y'all here with us? I want to encourage you to look to the person to the left and the right of you and make sure that as you are taken care of, they are taken care of for the entire time you're here. Yes? It's a very firm ground rule. Just make sure that people next to you belong the whole time. Yes? And make sure you know you're supposed to be here as well. Yes? All right, it's church. It's church. It's church. It's church with like none of the triggers. Trigger free church. <laughs> no, that's not quite right. It's not quite trigger free, but it's a safe space if you are triggered to say, hey, I'm triggered and have support and resources. Yes? That's amazing. we spiritual. It's great. If you haven't had a chance to interact with the, the engagements outside the OMI gallery and the other places you can process, please continue to do that. Um, please continue to check in with yourselves, with your bodies. Please continue to introduce yourself with your pronouns. My name is Chinaka. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and bro. Welcome back to Oakland. Uh, we have a DJ somewhere around here who is my all-time favorite DJ. Where are you at, Dion? Hey, way over on that side, Dion. <laughs> DJ Dion Decibels. From right here and also from Mexico, we thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you. You belong as well. What a family, what a family. Uh, and we also want to acknowledge some of the folks who couldn't be here with us today. One of our keynote speakers from 2015, Luis Garland Ocosta, who passed this year. We want to thank you and honor you and welcome your spirit into this room with us. One short moment for Luis. And in my community, we say ashe, which means let it have force, let it have power, let it be so. 
I want to acknowledge, yes, Asheo. I want to acknowledge Nipsey Hussle. Yes. For those of you who don't know Nipsey Hussle, Nipsey Hussle did this work. He did this work on the ground. He did this work on the ground in South and Central LA. He was about othering and belonging and unpacking those two things and building bridges across all kinds of places they say bridges couldn't be built. He's not here with us physically today, but his spirit is all through here, all through here. So we celebrate Nipsey Hussle's dedication to life. I also want to shout out my little cousin, Victor McElhaney, who was a musician and creator who brought his power into this room, this specific room. He was a drummer, and his life was taken from us way too early, just a few weeks ago, at 21 down in LA. So we honor Victor as well, and we say we are victorious for this entire conference. And it would be a personal favor to me if as you move through this work over the next few days, you can honor their lives and their legacies by making true, meaningful work happen, both here and out in your larger communities, yes? Thank you. All right, and we're going to transition right into the next, right into the next thing. Y'all ready to kick off this whole conference? We understand that this event is taking place on land that is not ours. It is traditional Ohlone land, and we recognize its continued importance to the Ohlone people. We'd like to invite on stage two people. One is Vincent Medina. He's a member of the Muwak. I'm sorry, I'm gonna say this right. Vincent Medina is a member of the Muwekma tribe, the Ohlone tribe, where he also serves as a councilman representing his family's lineage. He and Louis Trevino co-founded Makamham, an organization and restaurant focused on reviving and strengthening Ohlone foods and sharing them with their communities. Vincent was born and continues to live in his family's indigenous tribal area of Halkin. For those of you who don't know, I mean South Oakland, San Leandro, and San Lorenzo. His partner, Louis Trevino, is a Rumson Ohlone community member active in the cultural revitalization efforts of his people. He's focused primarily on the revitalization of the Rumson language and traditional Ohlone foods. He longs for a full and holistic revitalization of the lifeways of his ancestors, including language, story, song, art, food, and every other aspect of traditional Rumson Ohlone culture, and he is grateful to contribute to the effort. With his partner, Vincent, Lewis co-founded Makamham, which works to promote traditional Ohlone foods within their communities, families, as well as to educate the public about Ohlone cuisine and identity, family, family, family. Please welcome to the stage and into the space, Vincent and Lewis. <laughs> Orshetuhi makam, knakrakat Vincent Medina, ayekanamu ekmakna nerakat Louis Trevino. Nesamakrote huchun, hoshe warep, manni iriti holshemu ekmayahi suikne uyakish, at manni iriti holshemu ekmayahi suikne tuhi ayie. Hello to you all. What I just said in the very first language of the East Bay. The Chochenyo language is hello. My name is Vincent Medina, and I'm a member of the Muekma Ohlone tribe, and I serve on our tribal council and our tribal government for my family's lineage, rep representing our sovereignty and working to protect our traditional culture here in this area. I'm joined by my partner, Louis Trevino, who's Rumson Ohlone, and his family's from the Carmel Valley. And together, we started an organization called Mak Amham, which works to keep our traditional Ohlone food strong to, for the wellness and the health of our communities, of our tribe, and also to repair the wounds and the damage that colonization brought to this area, to decolonize ourselves and decolonize our diet in the process. This area has a proper name. Before it's ever been called Oakland, this area is called Huchun. This area has been lived in for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, too many years to ever count. Our people, in my family and my tribe, we've lived here forever, and I mean that quite literally. No generation of our people has ever lived away from the East Bay. 
In spite of all of the hardships, colonization, forced removal, the missions, the gold rush, genocide, assimilation policies, boarding schools, not being allowed to practice our religion freely until the 1970s, in spite of these challenges, our people have never left. And that comes from a fierce love, a dedication. Thank you. Thank you. That comes from a fierce love and a dedication that comes from those people before us. Those people before us are the, the ones who allow us to be here today, to be able to carry on our culture and work to repair those wounds and see a better future. Our old timers tell us when it's raining out and the rains are heavy and it's wet, they, they're reminded of our beginning stories about the beginning times of the world, when it was created right here in the East Bay. Our old timers tell us that the world was created on a mountain that we call Tuushtak, the place of the day. But when colonizers came in, they named it Mount Diablo, the mountain of the devil. But that's our creation place. That's our, one of our holiest places. And our old timers tell us about a time when the whole world was flooded except for the two peaks of that mountain. There, Mayan, Coyote, created the world after the waters receded. After a while, he created humans, us, the Ohlone people of this space. However, we weren't the first ones created. There were people before us and life before us, the rivers and the bay, the abundance that you see was created before we were created but we were created to be here in this space to live in harmony with this place forever. And we know that this place provided more than enough for our ancestors and they thrived here. They built shell mounds that soared into the sky. They lived in harmony with the environment and this fierce love allowed our people to be able to stay here, to remain here. When colonization came here, it brought, many, it brought pain to this area but colonization didn't affect us that long ago. My great-grandmother's great-grandfather was born in a pre-contact village before he, they were invaded, before colonization affected this area. It was only 240 years ago since California has been invaded. And we see what's happening right now as an extension of this colonization an extension of occupation of our homelands. But we know that we could also work together for a better future, a decolonized future that respects indigenous people, respects our wisdom, our culture, our aesthetics, our language, our religion, and respects these things so that they can flourish again, and that we could be able to live together in a world that's full of difference, where we all have our own individual cultures and can coexist with one another. It would be boring and dull to live in a homogenized world. And that's not what we want. We want to be able to live in a world where our culture is respected here in our homeland, but also that every other culture in the world is respected as well, and that we could respect each other's value of life for all of us around the world together. In spite of the hardships that our people have suffered through, our people have survived. In spite of the gold rush, in spite of the missions, our people have stayed put. And again, it's only because of the strength, that, that strength of those people before us that allow us to be here, to live here another day, to work to repair those wounds and to see a brighter future. Our tribe of this area, once again, is the Moekma Ohlone tribe. And I ask you all to repeat our tribe's name, Moekma, with me one time. Thank you. Our language of this area is Chochenyo. If you could all say that, Chochenyo. Chochenyo. The name of this area is Huchun. If you could all say that, Huchun. Huchun. Thank you. I appreciate it. This place is old. It was never a new world. This place has been settled and lived in for thousands of years. <laughs> One final thing. There are over 800 members in our tribe today, in the Muekma Ohlone tribe. And everybody in our tribe continues this fierce love, continues to work to carry on our culture. 
And while I'm up here representing my family and representing my tribe right now, I want to acknowledge all of those people who work together to work for a better future. And we also ask you, who are here as our allies, if you ever hear those dangerous misconceptions that are out there, that indigenous people aren't here, that these things aren't alive, that our language isn't spoken, or that Ohlone people are extinct, to call them out and say those things aren't true, that Ohlone people are here, that we speak our language, that this land is loved, that we'll never leave. And together, we could work for a decolonial, a decolonized future with us as Ohlone people central to this here in our homeland in the East Bay. Thank you all. On behalf of myself, Lewis, and the Muekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, and welcome to Huchun. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, uh, Vincent and Lewis, for grounding us into what is the real purpose and spirit of this conference. Uh, and I'm really, really delighted to be here and to welcome you to our gathering today on behalf of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Um, my name is Denise Hurd. <laughs> And I'm, an, I'm the Associate Director of the Institute. Along, uh, I serve with Don Powell, and I'm also a professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, and of course, I'm a medical anthropologist, and I am very excited about the purpose of this conference. I can't think of anything more important than talking about belonging, and everyone belonging to this society. Um, I was asked to say a few words about the Haas Institute that covers both the academic side that as a professor I work most closely with, but also how we work together on policy, how we work with artists, how we work with narrative strategies to get our messages across. So we have seven faculty clusters um, and they are working in areas so crucial to diversity and inclusion. They include a cluster on health disparities, on economic disparities, on educational inequities, on uh, religious diversity, LGBTQ, um, citizenship, and, uh, and democracy. And in fact, two of our clusters will be presenting in breakout gr uh, groups for the conference, and I urge you to attend them. So I think there's a powerful synergy with having 70 or so faculty members at UC Berkeley that are engaged and deeply committed to working on inclu inclusivity and honoring and celebrating diversity. Um, and I'd like to highlight some of the work that we're doing that shows the kind of projects that we're engaged in. And, and first of all, I just want to start off by, um, by m maybe sharing something uh, to say that, you know, nobody can really afford to be in an ivory tower these days, and we're not. Um, you know, my classrooms were turned upside down by the 2016 elections. Uh, UC Berkeley became targeted as a place where alt-right speakers were coming, and many of them um, specialized in speaking openly othering people in our communities who are brown, black, yellow, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or those who espouse feminist values. So I found that in my classroom, I turned away from the syllabus I'd planned, and we began spending a lot more time thinking about what does free speech mean? Uh, where does free speech end and hate speech begin? Um, I was facing students who were afraid to come to class. Uh, because posters were being circulated at UC Berkeley calling our faculty and students terrorists. Our students were having to look at a chalk scrawled uh, on places on campus openly uh, depicting hate speech. So um, our, the classroom and in fact the Haas Institute has facilitated a place where we can openly dialogue, where we can openly start to bridge differences and we can openly talk about how can we how can we create a more inclusive society? 
And I'd like to uh, highlight now one of the projects that I've been working on that's been incredibly inspirational. And it comes out of one of our Haas working groups where some, some of us decided that it was important to understand um, what's happening uh, in our administration and how it's affecting our society. And it was called, we're gonna study Trumpism. So not the person, but the policies and the ideology. So, um, but I decided, because that's a focus of my work, has been not just what's happening to people, but how are people working to change? How are they working to overthrow the conditions that have um, created problems for them within the societies? So, um, I was very inspired by a recent youth movement. One of, uh, one of the key social and public health problems that our entire society is facing is gun violence. Daily, people are being shot down. Um, we have you know, not only uh, individuals that are being victimized by gun violence, domestic violence, but we also have school children. Numerous, there have been numerous school shootings within the society. And until recently, no one believed that anything could be done. I mean, we've seen uh, Columbine, we've seen Sandy Hook, where 20 school children and six faculty were gunned down. Uh, as recently as October of, uh, last, of 2017, there was a mass shooting in Las Vegas that left 58 people dead and 851 wounded. Um, however, a mere six months later, a group of teenagers staged the largest gun control rally in America with about 850,000 people in the Washington Mall. I was greatly moved when I saw 11-year-old, fifth grader Naomi Wadley, who stood up to uh, bond with survivors, but also to bring to consciousness the names of the black girls who never make the news media when someone talks about violence. So um, these youth, Naomi and the other group of teenagers who have led a movement, um, it's been very, very impressive. The Parkland kids who were, there was a, a school shooting on Valentine's Day in 2018. After this shooting, these youth band together in an in, uh, crossing racial boundaries, social class boundaries, and all kinds of other boundaries to create a unified movement to wake up America. These youth have been tremendously successful. Um, only since they started organizing, within six months of the big national conference they had, 50 new state laws were passed, and there was an uptick in voter registration and voter participation among young people. So those are the kinds of things that inspire us that despite the othering context in which we're operating, there are true movements and true successes in the arena of belonging. Um, so, with that, um, I'd just like to urge you to learn as much as you can. I know that I am humbled to hear about the program that we have here today and look forward to participating in it. And now I'm going to leave you with a special video that also welcomes you to this wonderful event. Thank you so much. from our collective we. The tone has been set from the top around the world and the impacts are being felt everywhere. But we know that there is more that unites us than divides us and that our belief in our shared humanity is stronger than fear of our differences or what we might not understand. That's why the work you'll tackle over the next several days is so important. 
At this year's conference, you will explore the critical question of how we can work together to create a more inclusive world and ensure that every one of us feels like we belong. You'll think through what you can do in your personal lives and the work we can do together to transform systems and structures that support some but exclude others. Finally, as an African-American woman who was born in the segregated Jim Crow South, I know well the effects of oppressive systems. I know how harmful structural and institutional racism and gender inequality are. I know these systems must be dismantled in order to create new structures that recognize the dignity and humanity of all people and that we all deserve to be included in the promises and possibilities of our world. That's what this conference is all about. So today, I commend you all for choosing to be a part of this incredible event, and I encourage you to continue to fight for a kinder, more inclusive planet. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you. Yes, now you can hear me. Thank you, Representative Lee, for being with us today. Thank you for Denise Hurd, who spoke with us. Huge thanks to Lewis and to Vincent from the Ohlone communities. You guys doing all right? You can feel me, right? Like, I can see what the whole program is. I can see everybody backstage. So I feel like I have an undue level of excitement that doesn't yet meet yours. And so I'm trying to calm down and just read what's in front of me. Um, just bear with me. Uh, the next person to the stage is an amazing human I just got to meet. The first deaf-blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. Haben Girma advocates for equal opportunities for people with disabilities. President Obama named her a White House champion of change. She received the Helen Keller, Award, Helen Keller Achievement Award and a spot on Forbes 30 Under 30. Haben travels the world consulting and public speaking, teaching clients the benefits of fully accessible products and services. She's a talented storyteller who helps people frame difference as an asset. She's resisted society's low expectations, choosing to create her own pioneering story. Haben is working on a book that will be published by Hatchet in August. She's from Oakland, California, where all the cool kids are from. But you all belong here, whether or not you're from here. Please put your hands and hearts together for the unstoppable Haben Girma. Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for welcoming me. I am deaf blind and I wasn't able to hear the audience, but I'm able to come up with alternative techniques because people with disabilities are creative and always find alternative solutions. The system I'm using uses Braille. I have a computer up here with braille dots on the bottom, I run my fingers over the dots to feel the letters. There's an interpreter on stage who has a key for it that's wirelessly connected to my computer. And Becca is giving visual and audio feedback. Like when you all said, good afternoon, she typed good afternoon, exclamation mark. Connecting with people is really important to me. So I seek solutions to try to connect with people. And this is one solution. So throughout my talk, Becca's gonna be giving me visual and audio feedback from the audience. If people smile, if people laugh, if people fall asleep. <laughs> she's watching you. <laughs> Thank you. 
My name is Hathen Gurma. The name Hathen comes from Eritrea. It's a small African country. Ethiopia borders to the south and to the north is the Red Sea. My mother grew up during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. A lot of violence, a lot of fear. And schools were places where people got together and shared stories from all over the world. Stories are powerful. Stories influence the organizations we design, the products we build, and the futures we imagine for ourselves. She heard stories, America's the land of opportunity, America's the land of civil rights. Those stories inspired her to take the dangerous journey walking from Eritrea to Sudan. She was a refugee for about 10 months in Sudan. Then a refugee organization helped her come to the United States. Several years later, older, wiser, my mother realized it's not geography that creates justice. It's people that create justice. Communities create justice. All of us face the choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, a black woman, disabled, lots of stories say my life doesn't matter. The dominant story is that people with disabilities are a burden on society. That's the dominant story. I choose to create my own story. I define disability as an opportunity for innovation. Yes, I have limited vision and hearing. I have a disability. And notice I say disability, not differently abled or special needs. I like being direct and honest. I do have challenges. The story doesn't end there. The story starts and continues with all the different ways people with disabilities have for creating alternative solutions. I shared one, the keyboard and braille computer. I travel around with my guide dog. Lots of different solutions. Next slide. I want to share a video that shows sign language. Sign language is actually a form of innovation. If you can't hear spoken language, you can create a visual language. In the video, a young man is signing, and I'm holding my hand over his hand to feel his signs. This is tactile sign language. If you can't hear or see a language, you can create a tactile language that you can feel. People with disabilities all over the world have been innovative. And deaf communities all over the world have developed sign languages. The dominant one in the US is American Sign Language. In France, there's French Sign Language. Across the pond in the UK, they have a completely different language, and it makes no sense to me. <laughs> and they call it British Sign Language. So very few people actually think about this. But individuals who face disabilities have the opportunity to come up with solutions, and many do. And these solutions have the potential to benefit our entire community. Sign language is one form of communication. Another form of communication is dance. Next slide. We have a video that shows salsa dancing. And salsa is a form of communication. When I was a kid, schools, I, I, I actually went to school here in Oakland, in public schools here in Oakland. And at first, physical education was something I was dismissed from. I didn't feel I belonged in PE classes. And many instructors gave me that impression. When I was in middle school, I discovered a teacher who believed in inclusion even in the field of physical education. And she taught me salsa and swing and several other dances. She was actually a blind dance instructor. <laughs> In 
If one is blind and they can hear, they can hear the music and respond to the music. If one is deaf and can see, they can see the other dancers and see the beat or watch the hands of the musicians and see the beat. When I dance with partners, swing, salsa, other partner dances, music is communicated through their hands. The musicality and the beat can be felt. So I feel the music through the people I dance with. That's another way to connect and communicate with people and belong in a community. I've found many dance places all around the world that welcome me, and I've also found places that excluded me. A friend and I tried to go salsa dancing in DC, and the establishment said, you're not welcome here, no service dogs. And we explained, it was a very cold night, so we were standing outside and tried to explain, and they kept insisting, no dogs, you can't come in here. Disability is not a barrier to dance, but social attitudes and communities create barriers, and it's up to all of us to choose to remove the barrier. The default is people with disabilities don't belong, but there are thoughtful, inclusive people who take affirmative steps to create inclusion and create welcoming spaces. A lot of my success has to do with finding those people and meeting those people. One of my teachers in high school came to me one day and said, do you want to try surfing? And I thought to myself, how would a blind person go surfing? That seemed like the most far-fetched idea. But I told her, let's give it a try. Let's figure it out. So she introduced me to a community that does tandem surfing. Next slide. And in tandem surfing, we have a large board. Two people fit on the board. There's a water guide in the back. <laughs> Thank you for the applause. There's a water guide in the back who helps steer to make sure we don't crash into anything. And it was a fabulous experience. I can feel the power of the waves through the surfboard. It's amazing to feel the strength and openness of the ocean when you're out there on the surfboard. And I asked myself, this is green. How far can we go? How, how inclusive and accessible can we make this experience? And I asked surf schools, can I get surfing lessons? And they told me, we've never done this before. We've never heard of a deafblind surfer. Then I found a school that said, we've never done this before, but let's try. Let's find a solution. Next slide. So an instructor surfed side by side with me, and I was able to maintain control of my own board and practice the skills of surfing on my own. Wonderful, incredible experience. And I said, next, more. I found another surf school, this time in Hawaii, and we did another lesson. Next slide. And in this video, my guide dog watches anxiously as I ride the surfboard on my own for the first time. Oh, actually, it's <laughs> it sounds like we're missing a video. Can we go back? Oh, found it. <laughs> Excellent. Now you guys got a peek to what's coming up. So inclusion happens when people take affirmative steps to make it possible. Any activity you can imagine can be made accessible, even as far-fetched as surfing. It's about, it's about communities choosing to do the work, to choose inclusion. 
And I've been relying on people to do this. And I've also asked myself, what can I do in my community to make changes and to make our community more inclusive? And I decided to go into law because that's a field where you can have an impact in many different ways. And when I got to Harvard Law School, they told me we've never had a deaf-blind student before. And I told them, I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> we didn't have all the answers. We pioneered our way using assistive technology and high expectations. Harvard had a history of excluding people with disabilities. When Helen Keller applied to Harvard, uh, when she was looking for colleges to attend, Harvard wouldn't admit her because back then Harvard only valued men. Helen's disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that excluded women. Then over time, over time, the community changed at Harvard, and they started opening their doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. It's communities that create inclusion, and it's up to all of us to do the work to make our communities more accessible. Okay, let's go to the Obama photo now. <laughs> so I've been working as a disability advocate and that took me to the White House, the Obama White House. And <laughs> for the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. When I met President Obama, we explained that I'm deafblind and I access information best through Braille. He graciously switched from voicing to typing so that I can access his words. Inclusion is a choice. When you choose to be inclusive, you role model inclusion for the rest of your community and you influence others around you to make that choice. People with disabilities are one of the largest minority groups, over 1.3 billion people with disabilities worldwide. It benefits all of us. All of our bodies change as we age, and we deserve dignity and inclusion at every stage in our lives. So do it for people with disabilities, and also do it for you, because it affects all of us. Thank you. I'm here to take the questions. We're going to move on to Q&A, and I want to invite people to ask me any questions you want, but we're going to have people use the keyboard. So if you could come on stage, come to the table with the keyboard, and type your questions. You can ask about anything from advocacy to surfing. It's up to you. I think what we're going to do is identify the three folks who are going to ask the questions by a show of hands. And I get to pick, which is fun. So if you have a question, shoot up a hand. I'm going to pick from all three sections of the room. So right in front, boom, that's you. Um, person with a white shirt on, yes. And uh, Way in the back, I see a hand, person in a blue shirt. Yep, you see yourself as well. And then someone over here. I'm trying not to assume anything, but switch up phenotype. They're already wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> yes, right up, yes. I, I mean, he a G too, let's go. That's our third one, perfect. So um, if you can just come down to the front and queue with us, and if you need assistance getting there, please, please let us know. Hobbin looks beautiful. We became friends backstage, so now I'm just joking with my homegirl on stage. Thank you for that. No problem. 
We've almost got all three folks hovering. Perfect. Are we just going to pass the keyboard down? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And don't worry about spelling and grammar. I won't tell the audience if you make mistakes. <laughs> Hobbin promised not to tell anyone all the grammar errors I made backstage, even though I claim to be a professional writer. <laughs> all right, we are ready with our first question questioner. We have a seat here. Hi, and what's your name? Maria. Good to meet you. Great to meet you as well. I wanted to know, how do you help those with unseen disabilities to feel included? I'm wondering specifically about those with mental health issues. Also, please let me know when you're in DC. <laughs> I would love to take you dancing. <laughs> I love dancing, so that sounds great. <laughs> so there's a lot of stigma again uh, around mental health, and I really want our culture to change and accept that humans are all diverse, and disability and mental health and um, and. Uh, Invisible disabilities matter too. If we can get more positive stories in the media addressing the experiences of individuals with invisible disabilities, I feel that will help reduce a lot of the stigma. So my main suggestion is to help get more positive stories out there to address those issues and also make sure that there's proper healthcare services and everyone who needs it gets access to mental health services. Thank you, Maria. I think we're ready for our next person to ask a question coming to the stage. I also want to shout out that how we went to Skyline High School, go Mighty Titans. Hello, I've been following you for a while and thrilled to be here. I'm, uh, I, I missed that, sorry. I'm a deaf, uh, bilingual woman from Australia. Did I get Aboriginal? My question to you is, as in America, the Disability Discrimination Act has for many years tried to advocate for access. So what is your role 
between Aboriginal people here in America having access to information to the same information that you provide in your presentations here today to ensure that Indigenous people have access to information as well. So some of my talks and stories are online and on YouTube for free for individuals, but we need help getting those messages in additional languages. And if you know community organizations that can help translate that into more languages so more people have access, that would be amazing. I agree, totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Good to meet you, Marsha. Marsha says hi. My name is Marsha Saxton. I work for the World Indigenous. My name is Marsha Saxton. I work for the World Institute on Disability. I'm the critic of genetic engineering that seeks to eliminate people with disabilities before we're born. I appreciate your undefensive, unapologetic attitude about your disabilities. I appreciate your, una your unapologetic attitude about your disability. I have a lot of disability pride. a controversial issue and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to comment yes on prenatal testing for intent to abort fetuses with disabilities or would potentially become a disabled person so the dominant story is that people with disabilities don't matter. And I think a lot of parents and doctors subscribe to this dominant story. So my hope is to, to educate more of these parents and doctors and let them know that people with disabilities have lives worth living, that we're talented and, and contribute to our society. And they would be proud to have us as kids. We have one more young person with a question, and I'm a softie for young people, so we're going to let him ask a question. Thank you. We have one more person with a question. All right, one more question. My name is Koyo Tena. My name is Ko Koyotena. 
and I go to Sequoia Elementary School. And my question is, clapping. <laughs> what should kids do like with people with disabilities and like how to include them in stuff? Yes, good question. So when I was a kid, it was really hard to make friends. Most of the times, I did not have friends in elementary school. So if kids in elementary school can make an effort to reach out and connect to those who are different, or those you suspect don't feel like they belong, people need to take affirmative steps to be inclusive. So maybe you could share with those at Sequoia Elementary to be more inclusive and take steps to make their community more inclusive. There are a lot of people with disabilities, including my best friend's little brother. And my school has done a very good job including him. When I asked him about if his popularity was because of him or just people, he said it was because people liked to Good, good. So we want to be liked for our personalities. For, and, and I think all kids should, should get a chance to be affirmed for their personalities. Very good job. Thank you. It's so good. It's so good. I'll talk to you, okay? Thank you, everyone. You're welcome to reach out to me online through social media, and I'll also be here at the conference. Enjoy your day. One more time for Hobbin. Get him on. Like, for real. If you're not moved right now, there's something, there's something off. What a powerful moment. I'm so glad I got to witness it. I'm so glad I got to witness it with you. Like, that changed my life, and you were there for it. I'm glad you were there. I'm glad I was there. You guys doing okay in the back? Like, all the way in the back? You, you think I can't see you, but I can't? Yes, yes, you guys are doing good. Perfect, you belong here. Thank you for being here. Y'all ready to keep rocking? I ask real questions. Y'all ready to keep rocking? They're going to move the podium. They're doing a great job with this turnover. Thank you so much, Marriott staff. Next up to the stage, a member of the Upsaloke Nation. Superman makes his home on the Crow Reservation in Montana. Superman is Christian Takes Gun Parish, a Native American dancer and innovative hip hop artist who has dedicated his life to empowering and spreading a message of hope, pride, and resilience through his original art form. He's been the recipient of the 2017 MTV VMA Award for Best Fight Against the System. He's also a NAMI Native American Music Award winner, North American Indigenous Image Award winner, and a Seven Tunny Award winner. He was awarded the Aboriginal People's Choice Music Award in Canada for Best Video and was voted MTV's New Artist of the Week. His 2018 nominations brought him awards for Best Hip Hop Album and Best Producer for the Indigenous Music Awards. His latest videos, Prayer Loop Song and Why, have received millions of views online, which has put him in high demand, touring exclusive, or extensively through the US and internationally. He was recently asked to audition for America's Got Talent and the Broadway play Hamilton. Yeah, it's a great show. Uh, Superman's even better. Uh, he's currently working with Taboo from the multi-Grammy award-winning group Black Eyed Peas. Superman's one-of-a-kind presentation combines Native American culture, comedy, and urban hip-hop culture with dazzles audiences and captivates listeners. 
For this he has gained the respect of his community and his generation. The communicative talent along with the compassion it exudes from his music allows him to connect with people from all walks of life. His uncanny ability to motivate, encourage, and inspire through dance and hip hop music keeps him at the forefront among his contemporaries, which gives him a platform to educate on indigenous issues. Family, please put your hands together for my friend, Superman. All right, how's everybody doing? What an amazing event here. So as indigenous people, as native people, I was always taught anytime we come together with the people, we always open up in a good way. And that is through good words, song, prayer. So I'm gonna go ahead and offer a prayer for our time uh, together. Let's pray. I'll be praying in the uh, Apsaloga language, the, the ancient language of uh, my people, the Apsaloga. <clears throat> Akbartia Babichigaj and Balay Lagosh, D. Sesha Homuk, Bapti Chesh, Talisa Chesh, Bakhuik, Bilik Balewa Hamikarikta, Bawa Chajish Dik, Alit Chesh, Kogata, Balay Allah, Ik Bawa Chesh Gadam, Chiju Jalik, Malabashkulak, Konakosh, Hoho Isia in Awaba, Biligiwilak, Bawa Ihadi, Bihaki Livikur, Akilele Shdagulak, Shbabidulak, Shbilk Bagulak, Ahu. Turn to your neighbor, shake their hand, and say, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Turn to your other neighbor on the other side, give him a high five, and say, I'm glad you're alive. Yeah. Awesome. So, I like to introduce myself uh, in the Absalagat language. I say, Shodaje, Balaje, Age, Machalahuk, Biashe, Chidik, and Nawaba, Itchish. I said, Hello, my good relatives. My name is Christian Parrish, takes the gun, AKA Superman, come from the Absalagat nation. Or the Crow Nation is the mistranslation of our people. My Apsalaga name is Aweyage Machala, which means good fortune on Mother Earth. My clan is the Yashichira, which is the Big Lodge clan. So as you can see, I am dressed in a Native American regalia. You know, when you see a native dressed like this, you don't say, hey, nice costume, bro. You know, this is not a, a costume. A costume is when somebody dresses up to be something else, to be somebody else. But this is a part of who I am. So we call it regalia or, or an outfit. And uh, you see this beadwork, you know, that my wife and my daughter took their time to put their, their, uh, their thoughts and their prayers into every stitch so that wherever I would go, I would have something positive to say. I would bring that good medicine to the people. So as I'm standing here, you know, my family is with me as well, speaking with you good people. This style of dance that you see before you is called the men's fancy dance. It's the most contemporary style of powwow culture. If you know anything about a powwow, it's a celebration of native culture. There's singing, there's dancing, there's food, families come together, and uh, it's good medicine, you know, it's good for the people. So this is where that, this is um, what comes from that, uh, from Oklahoma. So this is an adopted style. I'm from Montana. This comes from the Oklahoma territory, from the Ponca people. It comes from the horse dance or the crazy dance, uh, which I was told. And there's other stories as well. But the values that come along with this dance, I was taught by my grandpa, who was Frank Takes the Gun. He was the president of the Native American Church, or peyote religion, ways of prayer. He fought the Supreme Court with other great men, and they won against the Supreme Court. So us as Native people can practice these ways, these spiritual practices, you know? Thank you. So he was a great man, you know? So he taught me the values of these dances. He said, grandson, if you want to come out to the circle and dance, he said, that's good. You can't come out here just to look all cool, you know, trying to win some money. You know, there's a lot of competition nowadays, and a lot of things are contemporary. He said, no, that is not why we dance. We come out to the circle to dance for the people, the ones who are watching. 
Some of them, they not, they're not able to dance. They're unable to, to come out to the circle. They might be in wheelchairs or whatever. He said, you dance for them. Some of them might be sick in their bodies. You know, they need a healing. He said, you dance for them. Some of them may have lost a loved one. You know, their hearts are heavy. He said, you dance for them. Make sure your heart's in a good place when you dance for the people. Because when the people watch you, they can see your heart through your dance. So if you have any ill feelings towards anybody, he said, go make it right with them first before you come out to the circle and dance for the people. Because there's a lot of healing that takes place through our songs and our dances. So those are some of the values that I was taught and I still uphold to this day. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate this dance called the Men's Fancy. And um, I want to dedicate this dance to all the missing and murdered indigenous women all over. Indigenous people all over. And if uh, you good people would help me honor them in a good way by just standing to your feet, I appreciate your respect. And maybe as you're standing there, you know, say a little prayer in your heart, you know, send some good vibes their way, you know, for their safe return and the comfort of their families. Thank you. Go ahead, have a seat. You see, to be a champion, fancy dancer like me, you got to be in the best shape of your life. Turn to your neighbor, give him three compliments. Go. Come on. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> now, turn to your other neighbor on the other side. Give them three compliments. Go. And don't lie. A little more on the monitors, thank you. Awesome. All right. So, everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. We got a lot of nice people here. That was more than three. So, I want to make sure everybody is paying attention this afternoon, okay? 
dun, 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 dun. If you're happy and you know we're clapping. Lions and tigers and bears. A lot of old school people here, what's up? Nationwide is... Hey, you guys watch too much TV like me. Red Robin. Okay, you guys got those here? Okay. Montana, I don't know. Baby Shark. No, 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 no. Don't take me back. Let's try it one more time. Dun, 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 dun. If you're happy and you know we're clapping. Lions and tigers and bears. Nationwide is. Hey, give yourselves a round of applause. You guys are with me. I like that. So, I am a practicing comedian, you know? So I'm going to go ahead and try some new jokes out on you guys. Is that okay? Okay, real quiet, real quiet. <clears throat> Right-legged horse seeks left-legged horse for stable relationship. Let's see what kind of crowd we got. <laughs> you know, I saw a dragon the other day trying to blow his birthday candles out. Yeah, he was mad. <clears throat> you know, I was going to tell some jokes about pizza, but I thought they'd be too cheesy. <laughs> I was right. Speaking of food, when it comes to fry bread, my auntie, she's like me. She needs the dough. That was brilliant. <clears throat> you know, we live in a crazy world. I wonder if the guy who invented the word umbrella just called it brella, but he hesitated. <laughs> umbrella. <laughs> you know, it's crazy out there in this world that we live in. You know, we got racism, we got terrorism, we got, you know, politics, you know, things like that. A lot of crazy stuff going on this day and time. You know, just recently, my son, he was, you know, yelled at. His teacher yelled at him for just talking back, you know, just yelled at his face. Yeah, he's homeschooled. <laughs> so it makes it okay, huh? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. If you're happy, you know, we clap your hands. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for some authentic Native American music. if you're having a good time so far.
Anybody heard that song by chance? By chance? Yeah, okay. Everybody clap your hands. Listen it right now, struggling, feel like giving it right now. I pray for you, pray that you come back home, pray that you understand you never alone. I pray for the single mothers and the deadbeat dads. You drop the kids off, school party gets me mad. So I pray, pray for peace, pray for change. Keep on praying, and everything stays the same. And I pray the pastors, all of the churches, and those who cry lights on, following hearses. I pray for you. The sick and the poor Pray for the rich man Who don't get to the Lord And I pray for wisdom And I pray for power And I pray for be ready In the final hour And I pray for those In the industry And I pray for my friends And my enemies Come on, clap your hands Everybody And everybody just Clap your hands Yeah, come on Everybody just clap your hands Everybody And everybody just Clap your hands Yeah, yo Let's break it down Come on Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, that was all right. My cousin could rap better than him. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. If you're happy and you know we clap your hands. So, you see this carpet that you're on. You pass that carpet, you get to the concrete, get to the foundation of this building. You pass that foundation, pass that concrete, you get to the dirt and the soil. And that is not ordinary dirt, it's not ordinary soil. It's the dust of the blood and the bones of indigenous people, of native people. This country called America, the USA, was founded on the genocide of the native people, you know, taking the land and uh, a lot of murders, you know, a lot of broken treaties. Just about every treaty was broken with the people. And so, you know, we look at the history and we can't forget, we can't forget the history of the country. It's important that we acknowledge it in our school systems, in our everyday, you know, in our conversations with one another. 
you know, I think it's important because the native people are still here, you know, resilience and still going forward in a good way. We might not be able to snap our fingers, change the systems that we're against, you know, certain people, but we can change this system right here in our own hearts, you know, for a better tomorrow, a better future for all of us. So turn to your neighbor, give him a hug and say, I love you. Yeah. Hopefully you ain't sitting next to your ex. Hey. <laughs> yeah. How many of you like hip hop music? Make some noise. How many of you like country music? Let's test you out. All oh, my exes. Okay, all right, we got some country people here. How about reggae music? Because every little thing is gonna. Okay, all right, see you. How about all kinds of music? All kinds of music, bam. There's my people right there. Listen to all kinds of music, man. Don't limit yourself. Spend time with people who don't look like you, who don't pray like you, who don't believe the things you believe in. Spend time with them, you know? That's what it's all about. Hey, yo, real quick. Everybody put your hand in the air like this. Put it down. Put it up. Stop. Somebody say, that's hip-hop. Somebody say, oh yeah. oh, yeah. Say, that's hip hop. So we're going to do some hip hop real quick. Hey, yo, but before I do that, you know, I had a dream. I had a dream. Hey, like our brother. I had a dream coming from the reservation. You know, colonization had a devastating impact on my people. So we see the reservation. We see the suicide rate three times the national average, drugs, alcohol, a lot of crazy stuff. And I come from that. So I was raised, you know, my childhood was rough. Alcoholic parents, foster care, all of that stuff. A lot of drama and chaos. But I believed I could do something good in life. I wanted to be a rapper from Montana. <laughs> that's, that's a task in itself, you know. You add being native on there, that's another task. You add being positive on there, that's another task. You add being drug and alcohol free on there. That's another task, you know. Being a father, being a husband. You know, I got three beautiful kids and two ugly ones. Hey, just kidding. We're all beautiful. So anyways, we put out some music. People started sharing my music and everything. And as my homegirl said, you know, we won the VMA, MTV VMAs, you know, last year for a song we did with uh, Taboo of the Black Eyed Peas. So it's been a, an amazing journey. And so I just want to share some hip hop music with you. When we won that award, I thought it was pretty awesome, you know? Wow, so all these people, on this side of me, there was Cardi B, you know? This side was DJ Khaled. This little short guy walks right in front of me. His name was Kendrick Lamar, you know? I was like taller than him. I was like, hey, what's up, I'm taller than you, and I'm the shortest crow. Hey. All kinds of people there. And then we were there representing that water is life movement in Standing Rock. Somebody say water is life. Water is life. So I'm going to go ahead. You know, we, yeah, many Wachoni, hey, my Lakotas. So we, um, we made music and we won that award. I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty up there, you know, pretty awesome. But then I thought, you know what? It's not all that. It was pretty cool, but it's not all that. All that. I went home and my kids said, Dad. I'm proud of you, you know. They looked at me and said, I'm proud of you, Dad. Bam, that was worth more than any award, many, any amount of money. The presence of family, the love of your family is probably the most important thing on this earth, to me anyway, and I value that. So it's an honor and a privilege to bring up my son, to come up on stage. My son. We're going to do some hip-hop music for you real quick. Can we, can we get this monitor turned up over here? Sound, can we get this monitor turned up on the stage? Check one, Appreciate two. it. Testing one, two. Dun, 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 dun. If you're happy, you get no way, clap your hands. All right, real quick, they're almost getting it. They're getting the monitor. Turn this monitor up if you can. 
Let's give it up for the sound people. Give them a round of applause, helping me out. This one right here. I can't hear it, I can't hear it. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Who wants a free CD? You gotta make some noise. Right here, right here. Over here, over here, over here. This side, this side. Check one, two, check one, two. Testing, testing. This one is right here. Over here. Hey! Heads up, heads up, heads up. Oh, yep, yep. Respect my elders, hey. This one right here, this one right here. Check one, two. Test. How about put your hands in the air like this? Put your hands in the air like this, come on. Testing one, two. Ever put your hands in the air like this, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, remove your penalties. It's getting hot and get Feel the adrenaline. I'm a gorilla, ain't nobody iller. Peace to Jake Diller, yo, I'm a big killer. You can't ignore the way I swing the sword. For the law, the lion, the zion, he rolls his war. Let him know, learning lessons, yo. There's a few things in my life, had to let him go. Goodbye, ex and nose, always kept the low. Stepping with weapons of blessings, now repping chrome. No confession, no, we just wrecking flows. Raw raps on horse, I'm from Crow to New Mexico. For the next episode, you can ask my wife. I ain't just rapping tight. This is a sacrifice. Bring you back to life. When I grab the mic, you can't just sit there, do something. You have to fight. That's right, that's the sight. You can hear the drums. There ain't no place to run, son. Cause here we come. Make it warriors who ain't afraid to stand. And if you feel me, don't hesitate. Raise your hands. Come on, 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 raise them high. 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 Come on, raise them higher. Come on, raise your hands. 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 Come on, raise them high. Come on, raise them higher. Come on, raise them high. Come on, raise them higher. Abomino, super phenomenal, jump in the vocal booth, yelling, Geronimo, but I'm a hostile crow, flow colossal, yo, I pray for lots of the we these things possible, so let's rock and roll, we ain't just stop and go, we on the mission, we fishing for lots of soul, gotta lock and load, like a hospital, giving you medicine, trying to be better, man, soldiers let us in, soldiers we veterans, keeping up high, trying to practice like Edison, soldiers scared of things, it still amazes me, basically, Satan be chasing me hastily, it ain't phasing me from pro agencies Spitting it faithfully Plant up like bakery That's the way to be Ain't nothing iller You can go hard man But I'm a gorilla Hey Hey Give it up for my son right here Hanzo Hey Awesome, awesome Look at your neighbor and say That was alright I was all right, my cousin. You rap better than him. Dun, 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 dun. If you're happy, gang, you know we clap your hands. So as you can see, Native American people, indigenous people, are like a lot of people. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They're teachers. They're rappers. They're almost comedians. <laughs> Working on it. And there's plenty of comedians. You know, they're brothers, sisters, friends, you know, daughters, sons. And so that's why we're all here today, you know, coming together in unity. Somebody say unity. unity. Say unity. unity. So this is what we're going to do. Music has that medicine. You know, how many of you heard a good song and it just took you back to that old time summer vacation or took you back to your ex hey, or whatever? You know, that feeling just kind of comes back, you know. Put you in that good mood sometimes. So I'm going to play some music medicine. I know you guys know these songs. I'm going to play them. And I want all you good people here to sing these songs as loud as you can. All right? And we're going to feel that good medicine today. All right? Somebody say good medicine. Here we go. Come on, sing with me. Come on, sing with me, sing with me real loud. Yeah. 
stay with me now, stay with me now. Come on, I know you know this next song. Let's sing it together real loud. Here we go, come on, yeah, yeah. You, come on, sing with me. You got what I need. Real loud, real loud, everybody. But you say he just a friend. But what? Oh, come on. Baby, you. Put your hands in the air like got this, come I on. Need. Put your hands in the air, sing it with me. Oh, yeah, everybody better be singing this from the front to the back, side to side, real loud. Come on, let's do that medicine. Come on. Yeah, when it's what? When it's what? When it's. Yeah. Come on, real loud, everybody. Let's feel that good medicine together. Come on. Somebody make some noise in this place. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Somebody say good medicine. And that's what it's all about right there is that good medicine, that good feeling. So I was always taught, open up in a good way and close in a good way, you know, that good medicine, that good feeling. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this. Snapchat video. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. First of all, I'm going to put it on that filter that makes me look young and handsome. <laughs> and I'm going to say, othering and belonging, where you at? And I'm going to raise it up. You guys just go crazy, all right? Just go crazy, man. Just feel that good medicine, that good vibes. Get loud. Let the universe hear you, okay? And I'm going to go all the way around. Here we go. Real quiet. Real quiet. Shh, shh, shh. Othering and belonging. Where you at? Hey. Hey. Oh, man, that was amazing. That was amazing. Don't forget to add me on Snapchat and uh, also on Instagram. I appreciate that. So with that, I'd like to thank you for being such an amazing group of people. And, hey, yo, we're just getting started, right? We're just getting started, right? Everybody stand to your feet. Everybody stand to your feet. Stand to your feet one last time. And I want you to go hug three people and tell them I'm here for you. Ready? Go. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys for being awesome. I am Superman. Have a good day. All right, other, all right, othering and belonging one more time for Superman. Nah, for real, for real. Like, you go to a lot of conferences. It's not very many that's gonna have you singing Lauryn Hill in the first two hours. One more time for Superman. One more time for my DJ Dion Decibels. Once more for yourself, because it can't hurt.
it's easy when you're moved to forget to like respond back. You know, you're just like it hits you in your heart and you're all quiet. But you guys doing okay? I know I keep asking that, but it's a fair question. We've asked you to take on so much emotionally in the last few hours. We're going to keep pushing you. Doing okay out there? Yeah. Um, my mom is here. It's not a big deal, except for I want you to clap like your mom is here. Thanks. Hi, Mom. Keeping it moving. I'm going to introduce our next two panelists as well as our moderator. Michael Bennett is currently with the New England Patriots, which means he's a chump. Yeah. And a three-time Pro Bowler, Pro MVP, Super Bowl champion, two-time NFC champion, and PWF, PFWC all-team selection. When Michael entered the NFL, rigorous performance training taught him the importance of eating nutritiously and how vital it is not only maintaining fitness, but overall well-being. With Michael and his wife, Pele, jointly established the Bennett Foundation, which educates underserved children and communi communities through free, accessible programming in Hawaii, Washington, Texas, and now globally. The foundation's Ocean Health Fest impacts thousands of people each year by offering free health screenings, fitness activities, cooking demos, and much more. Currently, the Bennett Foundation is partnering par partnerships with the Hope Heart Institute, Seattle TILF, Washington Green Schools, the Interagency Academy, STEM programming with I Am The Code, and most recently, after-school nutritional programming to, to provide over 20,000 meals in partnership with HCAP. Yeah, I'm gonna take a break, break in the bio so you can applaud what I've said so far. This past off-season, Michael wrote a New York Times best-selling book titled Things That Make White People Uncomfortable, and also visited Senegal, where he sponsors 100 African girls through his partnership with I Am The Code. Michael teamed up with Macklemore recently also to purchase copies of Teaching for Black Lives for teachers in Seattle public schools. He also held a girls empowerment summit in Seattle earlier this year titled Breaking Barriers with Patrice Cullors, Yami DeBrongo, Linda Sarsour, and Maya Wiley. He's a proud member of Athletes for Impact with fellow activists John Carlos, Ibitaj Mohammed, Maya Moore, Leila Ali, and Ethan Thomas. That is Michael Bennett, guest number one. I think, I think we're going to hold you all for like a, a miraculous intro. You know what I'm saying? Just hold there, and we're going to bring you all out at once. Next up to the stage is actor Don Lyon Gardner, who currently stars as Charlie Ward alone in the critically acclaimed hit TV show Queen Sugar. The show was created by Ava DuVernay and ex executive produced by Oprah Winfrey. I've heard of both of those women. She is a native Angelino and former teaching artist. Her advocacy work has long intersected with her artist work, ranging from youth arts empowerment to racial justice organizing towards gender equity issues. She's a member of social justice collective Harness, founded by America Ferreira, Ryan Pierce Wilson, and Wilder Valderrama in response to the 2016 election, whose members work to center marginalized communities in pop culture. In 2018, Dawn Lyon became an official ambassador for women's empowerment organization, Women for Women International. She is currently in production in the fourth season of Queen Sugar in New Orleans, Louisiana. Don will be joining us shortly. Yes, you can clap it up. Our moderator, Jeff Chang, has a bio too long to even get all the way through, but he's my big brother, so I'm gonna take my time. Jeff has written extensively on culture, politics, arts, and music. His first book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip-Hop Generation, is the seminal text on the text. Uh, he, edited the he edited the book, Total Chaos, The Art and Aesthetics of Hip-Hop, also wrote Who We Be, The Colonization of America. Uh, he does everything for everyone. His book won the Ray and Pat Brown Award for Best Work in Popular Culture and American Culture. He was a finalist for the NAACP Image Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. He ran the Institute for Diversity and Arts at Stanford for a long, long time and made it what it is. His latest book, We Gonna Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation, was published in September 2016. You can clap for that text, go ahead. It was named the Northern California Nonfiction Book of the Year, and the Washington Post declared it the smartest book of all time. I'm sorry, of the year. Uh, his next project is a biography of Bruce Lee. Um, he's been a USA Ford Fellow in Literature. He 
is part of the KQED Asian Pacific American Local Hero Club. He's part of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, is one of his YBCA 100 list makers. He does everything for everyone and co-founded Culture Strike and Color Lines and wrote for The Guardian. And he leads with a big heart and uh, a wider joy and is a great father and a great mentor and a great educator. So please put your hands together for our three panelists, Michael, Don Lian, and Jeff Chang. Please put your hands together. Now they're going to come to the stage, and you're going to clap till they get to their seats, and it's going to be raucous. Louder. 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 Am I just by myself? Oh, okay. How's everybody doing today? I thought I was going to get... Oh, thank you. Uh, I thought I was going to have like a small group. I thought it was going to be like 20 people. And then I walked in. I was like, whoa, this is like an NFL game. <laughs> but uh, today I have the opportunity to be able to talk about um, from the field to activism and being able to work in your community as an athlete and, and what does that mean? What does it mean to be um, on the field and still be in your community? Can you have both? Can you have success as a player and can you have success on the outfield? How do you build a bridge from the teams and how do you build a bridge from the city to bridge those two, two together? Because a lot of times the teams and the cities don't really connect. You know, we don't really do the organic work or work with the grassroots organizers or find out what's really going into on in the community. And as a player, you always wonder, how do we build that bridge? And so for me, um, this, that's what I'm about, is how, how do we build that? And my thing is about, why shouldn't I speak? It, that's really what it's about. It's really about, oh, the PowerPoint isn't on the stage? I don't, I'm, not fa I'm not famous enough to get a PowerPoint on the stage? <laughs> oh, I can't even see. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, mine is, is about why shouldn't I speak? I mean, as an athlete, as an athlete, you wear, you wear a helmet and people don't see your face. And people and the owners of the teams, they feel like they own your humanity. But at the end of the day, you're a human. Everywhere I go, I'm a black male. I can never hide the color of my skin. I can't hide any of that. So at the end of the day, we're always connected to the things that are happening around us. And as an athlete, we want to be able to teach the young kids what does that mean. And so uh, this, I don't really have PowerPoints at my house. <laughs> oh, it went back, went too far, sorry. And every time I think about that, I think about Martin Luther King, you know. You see, when, when, how do you keep going and not be silent about things and and really have that empathy for what's happening around you and still have that spiritual connection to the people that look like you, the people that don't look like you, and how can you have empathy for what they're going through and how can you connect to it? And for me, at some point, silence becomes a sign of dishonesty. You know, when you're out there and you're dribbling the ball or you're playing baseball, whatever you're doing, and you're sitting on that court, and for one second you think that you're not in those communities for one second, you think that you can't be pulled over and a gun can't be pulled to your head. This happened to me before. This happened to a lot of players. So just because you make money, just because you had to run and jump high, it doesn't change anything about you. You're still who you are. And you can never hide from your community. You can never hide from the color of your skin. You just got to be able to embody that. And for me, that's what I really focus on. It's more than just being an athlete. It's about joining together, the, respecting the women that play the sports, and how big of an impact that we can have. If you saw taking a knee and what LeBron did, what Cap did, what all these guys did, and how it really had a trickle-down effect to the youth, and that's what it's really about, how can we affect the youth? And we did that by showing different things that how we impact the community, whether it's taking a knee, whether it's talking about gun violence, whether it's talking about, you know, Me Too movement, how can we affect the people around us in a positive way? And I think um, this is the perfect generation for that. There's never been a generation where you can have this type of connectivity through your iPhone, through, through Twitter, through Instagram, and be able to show people what it feels like and how you can be connected to that. And for me, this is about humanity. It's about equality. It's about justice. 
and it's about the future of our kids. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm a little nervous because usually when I'm on the field, I can't really see anybody and I'm just in the helmet, nobody can see me, but now nah, it's cool. Um, it's about mass incarceration, you know, what's happening to the people of color, what's going around in, in the cities around us, how do we amplify that? And a lot of us are doing different things in our community to do bail reform, find ways to bring things to, to, the, to the forefront, you know. When you think about this, one of every three black American males are born today with respect to be in prison in his lifetime. That's a crazy stat. That's better than, that's a higher stat than Tom Brady winning the Super Bowl, me getting a sack, Russell Wilson, Marshawn Lynch running, running, scoring a touchdown. That's insane when you think about it. And then when you put it into this perspective, it's even, even more insane when you think about one out of every three black males will be in prison, one out of every six Latino men will be in prison. One out of every 18 black women will end up in prison one day. One out of every 45 Latino women, too. And when you think about that, when you're on the field and you think about the touchdowns that you score and these different things, it's like, but there's still things going on in the world. And how can we do something a little bit bigger than just scoring the touchdown, dunking the ball? How can we go out and make impact? And that's where we get to the intersectionality. How do we have... I'm sorry. <laughs> And that's really not a thing that we talk about in sports, is how do we connect things that are happening around us, whether it's Palestine, whether it's juvenile detention center, school to prison pipeline, gun violence, wherever it is, how do we talk about these things and how and find out how we connect it through all this, regardless of the color of our skin, our gender, what we choose, our religion, how do we stay connected to all that? And this is one of the things that we talk about. And I think about it, why shouldn't you speak? Why shouldn't they speak? Why shouldn't we all speak? Because we all have a voice and we have this platform and we have these iPhones, we have these computers, we do everything, we connect to everything, but why are people so scared to talk about things that are happening around them? Why are we so fearful? I mean, it's, I, don't, I try to understand why the guys that I play with, we're quicker to run into somebody and crack our heads open, faster to get CTE, quicker to break our arms, but we silent on things that matter in our communities. It goes beyond the need for me and the rest of the guys, a lot of guys that I talk about and the guys that are in the NFL, it's like we keep moving forward and finding ways to impact on a higher level, not just in our communities, not just on a national level, but globally. How do we connect to people globally, things that are happening, whether it's in Haiti, whether it's in Senegal, whether it's just around the world, how do we continue to have an impact and be fearful and not scared of the things that can happen to us because of our voice? We can lose sponsorship, but fuck it, who cares about sponsorships? So, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, money come and money go. At the same time, it's about how do we look our children in the eye and how do I look my daughter in the eye and tell her to stand up for what she believes in when I'm scared to stand up for what I believe in or the guy next to me scared to stand up for what he believes in and at the end of the day that's really what it's about it's about the kids and showing them how what it feels like to be a young woman or a young man and be able to have that why shouldn't we speak it's about the solidarity of all of us if you look at look around you see so many different people from different ethnicities different backgrounds different religions but at the same time we all Shit the same. We all are human beings, so what happens to you, it happens to me. When I look on TV and I see a mother losing their child um, at the border, that bothers me because I'm a father and I know what it's like when you can't find your child, let alone you can't even touch your child. So things that happen around us, we should be able to stay connected. And for me, that's really what it's about as an athlete. How can we continuously push forward and not be scared. We have so many people before us who have shown us the way, whether it was John Carlos, Muhammad Ali, and continuously have this voice and not Kaepernick. Where do we go beyond this need? Where do we go from protest into action? And that's the next step for the 21st century athlete. Thank you, guys. One more time for Mr. Bennett.
I want to remind you that we're going to have a panel discussion following this. So write down your questions for all of the speakers that we're going to have on the cards that are in your packet, and there'll be people around later to collect them. But we, have, we know you have thoughts and questions for, the, for our speakers, and we're going to get to them once more for Mr. Bennett, Michael Bennett. And please welcome to the stage our next panelist, Don Lee and Gardner. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Dawn Leon Gardner, and I am a former teaching artist and current actor, blessed to be playing a dream role named Charlie Bordelon on a, on a dream TV show <laughs> named Queen Sugar. I am truly pleased and honored to be with you here today. And before I do anything else, I really do want to thank John A. Powell and his team for inviting me. Especially for today's program and panel, they were amazingly patient and waiting until I could confirm that my shooting schedule would allow for my absence today. So thanks to my Queen Sugar family, uh, who basically let me come. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a welcome breath in a very intense fourth season, so stay tuned for June 12th when we premiere Shameless Plug. <laughs> But really, um, it really is a dream for me to be here. I've actually known about this conference for about four years now. Um, I remember exactly where I was when I heard about it. Uh, it was, I was on a, on a long walk from the 161st Street stop of the D train in the Bronx. Um, and I was headed to that big shopping complex with the Target and the Bed Bath and & Beyond and the and the stuff, and I was planning to grab some things that I needed for an apartment that I'd moved into in Harlem about a year earlier. And knowing that it would be a long walk to and from the train, and being a native Angelino, I am always trying to reduce my walking time as much as possible. So I knew that it was gonna be a long walk, and I was looking for the shortest sort of way to make that happen, and I anticipated I might have some bags, and it might slow me down and all that, so I popped in my earbuds, and I turned to a podcast that I loved, that I still love, uh, and it's Krista Tippett's On Being podcast. Yes, absolutely. And the most recent episode started playing, featuring a guest that was then unknown to me, Professor John A. Powell. And from the, it really is. And from the first moments of the episode, which included words like, race is a little bit like gravity, I was wrapped. I stopped thinking about anything else. I just wandered around Target, mindlessly, <laughs> unable to shop or do much of anything except just take in this brilliant, game-changing conversation for me. And I didn't realize then that I was, I was really screaming for it, even though it wasn't a conversation that I was necessarily new to. 10 years earlier, I was working and living in Los Angeles, where I am very proudly from. Yes, indeed. Deeply, we get a bad rap, but we're at, like amazing, so whatever. <laughs> the natives, we're whatever. Um, so I was deeply steeped in social and racial justice work, some of it through teaching artist work, which was mostly in South LA, one of my home communities, but also through some other activist organizations, including a short-lived one called the Racial Justice Alliance. And that was born out of the effort to create accountability from a group that is still going in LA called AWARE, which stands for the Alliance for White Anti-Racists Everywhere. My engagement in that work was the blooming, really, of a racial and social justice awareness that had been seeded in high school for me and was finding its soil in student activism during the Bush-Gore election. And by college, it had really developed into a viable alternative to the life and the arts that I was choosing. I deeply debated throughout my second year at Juilliard. I was really at a crossroads whether or not I should leave the school, which I was learning to love this craft of the thing that I love to do, acting and claim ownership of this thing that I felt was calling me to engage with the world directly with all of its complications and its issues, activism. But at the end of that year, I did stay at Juilliard and I stayed an actor reasoning that my art would be my activism. In art, I felt, I could not only question the systems and the assumptions by which we live our lives, but I could investigate the corners of my soul and share how those two things interact and intersect. 
and that the very act of committing to being an artist was something of a liberation, if not a radical rebellion as a person of color. But even there, even in these spaces of art making, I remained so hungry, starving for just the opportunity to unpack race and gender and culture and the inequities of our history and anti-blackness and on and on and on directly. So that long walk back from Target became longer and slower, but in the best way. After the episode finished, I immediately followed it with the unedited version of the episode, which is serious, because that's another hour and a half. And I kept stopping to rewind and hear these things articulated, these things that I felt fractured by and whole in, and that I had been searching for ways to make space for them. And when I finally made it home, I looked up John A. Powell, and I found the Haas Institute, and I proclaimed to my partner, I'm gonna go study with John A. Powell. So little did John know, my being here was the power of intention <laughs> from four years ago. I think four years ago, the part of me that leaned into this conversation was the same part of me that was trying to make sense of what I saw in the mirror every day growing up. And at times what I still do in the morning, I would literally stand there and go, okay, so you look like this because your mom looks like this and your dad looks like this. So that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. And I think it wasn't clear to me at the time that part of what I wasn't seeing was myself. Not that I wasn't seeing black people and that I didn't identify with black people, of course I did. But I wasn't seeing um, specifically half black, half Chinese people, half black, half Chinese kids. And so the only place that I saw that face was in the mirror or in my brother's face. And to that day, I think it accounts for why we are so close. We are basically best friends now. Um, but I remember being startled every time that I did see that face in the mirror. And I, I was in this process of reconciling every time. And I don't think that I'm necessarily special or alone in that. I think I think we all go through a process of reconciling ourselves, of our world, our parents, and how we came to be in our particular life, conscious or not. For me though, I remember I was doing it on this micro level of culture. And it wasn't just what I looked like, but it was also what I felt like. And I would have these experiences where I could feel and think, okay, I've got two choices of how I'm gonna respond. This is one cultural response, and this is the other cultural response. Which one makes sense? And there were times when those two things were the exact opposite. Like, uh, <laughs> I remember my mom describing to me uh, sort of a classic Asian proverb, and it's one that she really rebelled against actually, but the proverb basically goes, the nail that sticks out is the first to be hammered back down. And the lesson there culturally is, don't stick out to which I can hear my entire ancestral line on my dad's side go, nah. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> you know, like, girl, you better stand up. I don't know what you're doing. So that's what I've been navigating and questioning and learning to make room for is this evolving relationship with identity. In the context of really a lifetime of reconciling, a lifetime of unlearning the habit of othering myself to myself, a lifetime of learning, learning how to belong to myself within myself. And in a certain sense, I really fought to get clear on how I identify, which at this moment is this. I walk in the world as a black woman very proudly my experience is that the world does not see or engage with me as someone of Asian descent. My experience is that when I walk down the street in the world that we live in right now, I am engaged with as a black woman. That's the lens that I have. It's the lens that I can speak directly to. And I've had no other model in my life except pride and honor to do that. I literally don't know what it is to walk in the world as an Asian woman. 
I don't know what it is to walk into a store, what assumptions color those interactions, what happens in people's eyes who see me that way. I've watched it very intimately with my mother, with cousins, with aunts, but I haven't lived it. I can't claim that experience. And at the same time, my internal cultural truth, my internal cultural experience is this dance between both. And they are equally partnered. I grew up with both sides of my family in the same city. They all knew each other. They all loved each other. They all hung out without me. Um, and so those cultural realities are lived. They are in my DNA. They cannot be extracted. And I wouldn't want them to be. And like all partnered dance, this dance that I do internally, it is one of tension, of relief, of beauty, of conflict, and of reconciliation. I'm learning that it is up to me to make space for this dance. And the time that we are in is demanding that space. If I do not fearlessly engage with this process of self-inclusion, of allowing all parts of my experience to be true, to be weighted, to have face and voice and contradiction, then how can I possibly be in the question honestly of how do we belong to each other? To be honest, talking about this is something of a risk. To talk about myself at all is something of a risk. As a storyteller, my greatest joy and my greatest goal is for an audience to literally forget about me, to give over to the journey of a character that relies on my body, mind, heart, and spirit, but that is actually not about me or even you. It's about the us. That journey that asks us to take ourselves on and see ourselves in each other, for me, that journey is about the most important questions coursing through our time and our veins, about who we are and who we are becoming and about how we do and don't belong to each other or to ourselves. I believe in the power of storytelling. I believe that story and narrative are primal in nature, that they have an unparalleled transformative power. And I have seen it in action in community, watched miraculous extensions of forgiveness and confrontation and healing and courage within relationships facilitated by plays and music and films, etc. In the best instances within myself, I've actually felt molecules change and shift and rearrange themselves in the midst of a story. And I'm sure somewhere studies have been done to show brain changes as a result of engaging with story. In fact, as I feverishly Googled John A. Powell four years ago, in one of his talks that I came across, he mentioned a study wherein parts of the brain that recognize humanity were shown to light up, essentially in response to story. That's basically proof of how essential story and narrative are to human empathy. And to facilitate that, to serve that as an actor, it's a hard thing to describe how right that feels. To get out of the way to allow that conversation between an audience and a performer or performance happen, it feels something close to purpose. But I don't have that privilege. It's a privilege that I've heard claimed by some of my white colleagues, by classmates that I had at school, to step back and to disappear. I don't have it. I don't have that luxury. Not now. Like many artists of color before me, I understand that my work is completely intertwined with history, with society, with identity, and yes, with belonging. And in a time in a time of risen white supremacist movement gone unchecked, in a time of media sound bites that tend to de-dimensionalize what people say for profit, in a time of loneliness as an epidemic, and us versus them in social media spaces as echo chambers, it is my duty to be the nail that sticks out, to contribute by voicing these truths to contribute by voicing these truths and sitting with the discomfort of them and trusting through the vulnerability of them that something like the beloved community is still possible. And so, my prayer is that if you tune in June 12th, <laughs> 
that you give yourself permission to forget about me and this talk and to take the journey, to let yourself be moved, even transformed by story, to see yourself and to include yourself. That's the greatest gift, back to me. I will end with this story. This talk is called Egg Drop Soup. And unlike the name that the title suggests, it's not a conversation around recipes. Um, about six years ago, I was making soup. I was in the kitchen and um, I was making a version of egg drop soup. I can't really claim it's egg drop soup. Like my mom would be like, that was not egg drop soup. <laughs> but it was some version of egg drop soup, which is really sort of fun to make. Um, and my fiance now, boyfriend at the time, walked in and he was like, oh, hey, babe, what are you making? And I said, egg drop soup. And he said, what's that? And I said, and this is a quote, you ain't never had no egg drop soup? <laughs> Just like that. And in that moment, we, we looked at each other and he said, babe, I know that you say that you're half black and half Chinese, but no. You are 100% black and 100% Chinese. And that just proved it. So egg drop soup is not, when you look at egg drop soup, for those of you who don't know egg drop soup, it's not like that very comfortable, wonderful, feel-good feeling that you get from egg drop soup, like chicken noodle soup or gumbo or some sort of stew. It looks sort of weird. It's sort of like, like, you, sort of like these wraithy things floating around in a broth, and you're like, I don't know what to feel <laughs> as I look at this. And in some way, that's an apt metaphor for where we are right now. We are not in a place where it's comfortable. We're not in a place where things tend to feel and um, they tend to make sense and they tend to feel uh, like they're all fitting together. There's no, there's no, you know, soup that's just making the ingredients all mushed together well. That's not the place that we're in. But I still feel like it's a nourishing soup. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that offers us uh, protein and uh, minerals and it's important that we eat this soup. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. One more time for Donnelly and Gardner. Oh. I'm filled to the top, but I'm so excited there's more coming. I told you you had comment cards and question cards in your packets. Some of you don't have those. I apologize. Way to mislead you. There are some coming through. They're going to bring them through while we have this next panel discussion. So if you need some, just keep an eye out for them. They'll pass them around. Those comment cards will then filter up to Jeff Chang, who's going to moderate the discussion. But let's welcome back to the stage Don Lee and Gardner. Rachel Kudzi Ganza. Michael Bennett and our amazing, outstanding moderator, the indomitable, Jeff Chang. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Good evening, everyone. That was weak. This is Oakland. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, yeah. We got an author, an artist, an athlete here, an actor. Come on, this is like, this is a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm so honored actually to be able to be on stage with all of you. Uh, thank you so much for, not just for your amazing presentations, um, but for all that you do, for all that you represent uh, for us out in the world, and for all the change that you're individually and collectively bringing about. Thank you so much for all you do. I'm wondering, actually, if we could start with a little bit of a personal type of thing. <laughs> um, I, I was so moved by each of the ways that you 
presented uh, the approach that you take towards your art and your activism. And I'm wondering if you could tell us, each of you, if there was a particular moment where things kind of locked into place for you as far as thinking about, oh, this is my purpose. This is what I need to do. This is how I need to be able to be in the world. Um, Who's first? Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I, w I don't, my, my instinct is to say not yet. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that it's a constant act of evidencing or, or trying to do something um, again and again and again with the same sort of like energy. So I, I, I don't think I've plateaued in the sense where I'm just like, it's done, I know what I'm gonna do, it's perfected. Um, but at the same time, I think that I've always written and I think that it's the way, the vehicle for all of my self-expression. Um, and so I think, I used to write these columns in middle school for like our paper where I would invent these like elaborate comics. I mean, I would basically do a whole newspaper myself and people really liked them. So I kind of enjoyed putting myself out there and people understanding my comic books, I don't know, that I would write. It was rewarding. Um, and so I think getting a little confirmation helps mm -hmm. solidify mm -hmm. something. Down the end? Um, I don't know if Ron, can you hear me? Is it? Can I can hear, hear you here. Can, the, can you all hear her? No. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I was about to be my theater self. <laughs> um, it's evolving. Mm -hmm. It's evolving. Um, I, I know for me, I know that Queen Sugar has been such an important, critical part of that process because it allowed me to really step into a public space, a quote, celebrity space, with something that was so aligned with who I am and with what I actually cared about. So when I was speaking and promoting the show, I was able to speak exactly to the things that I actually wanted to talk about, those conversations that I most wanted to be in as an artist. Um, so I know that that was critical. And, it, and I think entering that public space was a wake up. Um, I was really, and still I'm fairly disturbed at sort of the um, silos that I feel like media can create. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I was also, I sort of put myself to task with how I was participating in that, how I was now stepping into that, those spaces. Um, so now I feel like what is most, I don't know, at issue for me or front page for me is this idea of vulnerability and the ask, the call, the cry to allow ourselves to be uncertain. I think we've spent a lot of time, and, and this is sort of how I've, where I've landed right now. I think we've spent a lot of time um, figuring out how to stand for ourselves and what we know, what we need to be um, defensive about, what we, need to, what we need to protect, what we need to say, to stand up and say something about. And that can't go away, it shouldn't go away. But I'm listening for and looking for the spaces to, to not know together. Mm. So that, that's evolving, but that's where I find myself right now. Mm. Yeah, uh, for me, I think it started when I was a, a child, really. I think when I look back at my life and I think about um, the moments that, was, that helped me you know, get to this spot, I think about my mom, everybody in my family went to an all-black college, so I spent a lot of time at Grambling University, and one of the things that I got to do was I was always at these football camps with Eddie Robinson. You know, obviously he's the most winning football coach ever. So mm -hmm. I used to be at these camps and a part of the camp was um, African-American studies. So it was like a NAACP camp, but it was like football too. So uh, mm -hmm. it was like, I was like, mom, why do I have to go to Louisiana again? <laughs> I want to stay in Texas. But uh, so I used to go there every summer. And I think like being in that surrounding and learning the history of um, um, of who I am and what, what my culture's been through. Like there's a sense of sadness and there's a sense of being proud. And I think um, along that line of being able to learn about the athletes who came before me or the athletes that were doing stuff and listening to the coaches talk, 
um, it kind of just like push, propelled me as I started to get older and I started to learn about these things and I started to not be scared to use my voice. And obviously my mom's a teacher and she's been in the teacher for like 25 years. So it was always this um, connection to the community and my parents, both my parents were like that. So I think I just got it really early for my parents to like be very vulnerable, like she said, but also be able to have empathy for people, things that are happening around you. And I think um, as a black male, those are something that people don't really talk about is vulnerability and, uh, and sensitivity and emotions. I think a lot of times you get shed off and I think that forms, happens to form a sense of like PTSD. But I think because my parents were um, very connected to that, it helped me like uh, be the man that I am today. Mm-hmm. One of the things that strikes me is all of you um, write so deeply about trying to help people recognize the humanity uh, in each other. And, uh, and, and in a sense, the, the work that you do, the art that you do um, in your writing, Rachel, in your acting, Damian, in your, uh, in your being on the field, right? In your uh, athletics and also in your activism too, Michael. Um, and, and one of the things too that, that resounds, I feel like, through all of you is this sense of legacy, this idea of, of uh, carrying forth um, you talk about your Ghanaian and Southern roots, you talk about your Chinese and black roots, you're talking here about your parents and, and the, the legacy of, as well of Grambling and what that means as an institution um, culturally. I, I, I'm struck too just about this particular moment that, that the idea of family and community is so much what we're, we're reaching for. Do, would you agree? It's been for me uh, the last three years really striking and how much, how much more time I've spent with my family in the last three years. Um, and it's definitely connected again to Queen Sugar that so much of the show is about family and about legacy, especially for black communities. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I mean, Michael's right. For me, my whole sense of identity can't be separated from my parents and they can't be separated from the kinds of work that they were into, the kind of um, values that were in our house, for sure. Um, and there is a sense, I have a sense deeply, uh, that either of what I owe or what I'm sowing or something for the past and the future, mm-hmm. I really c- don't see myself existing outside of that context. Um, so I can feel that uh, I'm in this conversation of what do, what's the vision? <laughs> What, what is the vision that we're moving toward? Is that vision still the beloved community? How do we define that? How do we articulate that now? Um, I, I feel like that's the, the biggest call and maybe the biggest problem is the inarticulation of that vision. Mm. Um, and it, there's nothing simple about that. Like, it's, it's not like it's easy to name those things. So that for me, that's where I find myself in terms of legacy is constantly sort of um, going thank you to the past and thank you to both branches of my family and constantly saying I promise to the future. But Mm -hmm. that to me, to be honest, looks more nebulous than I want it to. I think too, I think what she's saying, like that the past and the present and the future is all connected. I believe in that too. Like personally for me, like, you know, digging deeper into my roots or like digging into the African side of me, going into that part and being in Senegal and being at the point of no return and, you know, feeling the essence of what that really means. Like, what does that really mean to be, you know, snatched from your family and put into change and being into bondage and... Um, being there is kind of like in those spiritual journeys like that it's just kind of like helped me kind of understand what it means to have a legacy to be a descendant of somebody who has had that happen to them you know when I think about my daughter and I think about if I went into my house and she was gone and I never ever saw her again and I never thought about what, what could have happened to her did she have a family and nothing ever happens and I think about the I'm the descendant of that I'm the descendant of somebody who was strong enough to make it across the transatlantic, somebody that was coming here to live through slavery, Mm -hmm. somebody who could come here and create their own. And I feel like because I have that inside of me, 
to be silent and not to let the sun shine on my voice would just be so cowardly. And I think that's important to always honor those people who came before me because they risked so much for me to be in this moment. And times like that, it's like whenever I think about that, that's what keeps me going and keeps me power, powering through life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, it's funny because we talked briefly that we both have Louisiana heritage, but yeah. you're Grambling and I'm Southern. Yeah. So my grandmother taught at, at Southern University. My great-grandmother taught at Southern University, which is so unusual. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And then taught high school in Alexandria, and my mom is a professor. And so my mom actually, her water broke while she was teaching with oh me. Oh my God. <laughs> and so I sort of feel like I was born in a classroom, um, <laughs> but I'm not an academic. But I do think that I look back on the women in my family because I do come from a very extensive matriarchy and I think about how, I don't think of myself as an artist, but I do realize that I have a few more liberties than they were able to have. And so whenever I am able to sort of make art I think of myself as being an extension of their silences, where they had to make very pragmatic decisions of like, I'm going to get a PhD, I'm going to be a teacher. Um, and I also, you know, I always say that I feel like I am the thing that they were rooting for that's arrived at the horizon, you know? Um, that I have all of their energy and all of their efforts can manifest in whatever I put forth. And so there's an enormous sense of responsibility um, and also obligation of that, they didn't do all that work for me to flounder. Um, and so I, when I try to t think about what I'm gonna write about or what I'm gonna think about next, I often think about how am I gonna correct something that's been told about black people where we haven't had the authority to mm -hmm. tell it properly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's, that's very important to me in my work. It actually, it reminds me of B. Mike, the artist from New Orleans, right? Who has a t-shirt that says, I am my ancestors' wildest right. dreams, right? right. Um, be Mike, right? Nola is amazing. Um, one of the things that, that strikes me, though, is that we're, we're in this moment, this historical moment of division, right, in which so much is, feels like it's tearing apart, and that part of what we're trying to do in our movements and individually is to reach out, to try to find, you, you were talking about vulnerability, we're trying to find ways to be able to connect with each other, and vulnerability, noting where people are hurting and going, moving to them, right, is, is sort of part of what's happening, I think, in, in this particular moment. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the politics of the other side, because your piece mm -hmm. about Dylan Roof, mm -hmm. one of the things that strikes me about that piece is how rootless he was, rootless, R-O-T-L-E-S-S, -S, and ruthless, of course, as right, well, right. Um, that he didn't have a sense of, of, of roots, and that there was a there was um, a way in which he was, he was, he was spinning as, right. as an individual. Um, talk a little bit about what, what that piece meant to you and, and what you found as you were exploring that. And I'd, I'd love to hear what the two of you think about this particular moment as well, as you see what's happening around you. Um, you know, it was interesting. The first time I started to think about reporting about the alt-right and... Um, white identitarian movements was long before anyone was talking about it. And so it seemed like I was kind of having like a fringe episode of paranoia, mm -hmm. where I'd be like, I'm gonna go and report about neo-Nazis. And people were like, there are no neo-Nazis, what are you talking about? <laughs> Hillary's gonna win, mm -hmm. and everything's gonna be great. And mm -hmm. what had happened was that I was going through, because I'm writing this book of, I don't know why I took this on for my first book, of 400 years of black American history, whoa. <laughs> um, In one volume? <laughs> um, that was the writer finger. I, you know, I've been <laughs> going thought. through the Hold South that. and doing all this reporting, and I'd gotten to Charleston, and I'd gotten to Mother Emanuel Church where the, the, the horrific shootings occurred. And at night I would go around Charleston and have these crazy conversations with people in Charleston about race and what had occurred, and I was like, something is brewing. Hmm. Something is wrong here. People are not getting this. And that was when I was starting to think, Dylan is not a singular event. Dylan's a continuum of how we talk about race and racial violence in America. Um, and so when I, when, I, when I think about reporting or writing that story and like what, why I did it, it was because 
At the time, my grandfather from Louisiana, he had just passed away, he was maybe 98, and my grandmother had passed away. And when I looked at those shooting images in the courtroom, um, I imagined that occurring to them. Mm. And it made me so, I went to Quaker schools my whole life, so violence is not something I know well, but I wanted to kill him. <laughs> and I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I was sitting in the courtroom and he was so, I don't want you to talk about my family. And he was his own lawyer, so he was controlling the proceedings. And he kept saying to the victim's family, you're talking too long, or I don't want to hear about these people, or, you know, they're, they're dead, or, you know, whatever he was saying to insult them. And it was just so rage-inducing that um, the reason I decided to write it about Dylan and not my original angle of writing about the people who were lost is that Dylan was convinced that he should have the right to silence and to not have his life investigated. And I felt that if I couldn't physically harm him, I could harm his desire to have privacy. Wow. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's, it's sort of that thing of, of privilege being the ability to be able to disengage, which I think is what you're talking about, Don Leon, in your, in your talk, right? That, that the way that he could preserve his, his sort of safety would be to, to, to disappear, right? To, yeah. to be or, able or to... You know, the controlling of the narrative of that, so mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the record that's out there is always troubled person emerges out of nowhere and kills a bunch of people. No, troubled man of 25 years was, was enabled to think that he would have this autonomy and this right to violence. Yeah. And that means many people were complicit with this and they all need to be called out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. so the question always comes back around, like, so what, is, what does art do in, in this kind of condition, right? What, do, what does being in the culture do, what can it do in this kind of situation uh, where we've got society so deeply polarized, and I guess I wanted to throw that question to you, Dalian. Uh, one of the things that, uh, to go back to John A. Powell for a moment and four years ago, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I remember from that conversation, he said the words, in this, I think I'm paraphrasing, is we are makers of each other, or we are making each other. And I feel that as culture makers, we're not only in charge of narrative and story, but we're in charge of, or at least we are contributing to, how we are walking with narrative and story, how we contain it, how we receive it, how we ingest it, how we encourage each other to become and evolve through it. Um, I just don't see any route right now that will be the vehicle for empathy to evolve beyond what it is right now, which is what I think needs to happen. Um, I don't see it happening through legislation necessarily. I think mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a part of it. That's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we have the trust anymore of politicians the way that we did back when everything was going down in the 60s that needed to go down legislation-wise that shifted everything. Um, I don't think we trust, I don't think that, and I think with reason, we don't extend that kind of trust to um, our lawmakers because of special interests, because of all the money, because of all the, all the stuff. But we do do that with artists. Right now, I believe artists have the ear of the people. And it is so critical that we are responsible with what we are saying, that we are um, also the voice, you know, of the people, um, and that we are constantly, to sort of get back to what you were saying a second ago about Dylan Roof and basically whiteness, that we are constantly deepening a conversation. I think that's what I've always been leaning into as an artist, it's what Queen Sugar does, I think, in, you know, in a sense, is deepen these conversations around identity and, and blackness and evolution and legacy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I think our, our role is, and I truly believe there's just no other, there's no other force that could fulfill it. It is the arts that will do that. Mm -hmm. Michael, this reminds me of this really powerful story that you tell in your book 
First um, of all, why is my chair so small? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm really not comfortable in this chair. <laughs> but just go ahead. It's just so small. Like my back is so big. I I do see that. I do see that. Yeah. Are you uncomfortable? <laughs> I know, Should we get like you this. like a stool? Yeah, I got bad back. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's perfectly sized. We just want to say that for me, but so go ahead. It's all right. <laughs> um, man, how do I follow that? I had, I had like a real, no. So actually, no, I, I do want to come back to this because there's a story in your book where you're talking about, uh, this is going to the point about converse, deepening the conversation, right? Where you all uh, decide as a team what you're going to do and you do it and then you, the next day, you show up at the practice field, and there's a protest going on. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, what you did in that particular moment. Yeah, I think at that moment we had like a deep conversation about each other, I mean about where we came from, our background, because on the football field, it's like this, this idea that we, um, we all come together and we don't have any quarrels, like everybody's the same, but it's like when you start to hear the stories of where somebody's from the Midwest or somebody's from L.A., somebody's from over there, and then to have a deep conversation about that, it gets really heated. And finally, when we made a decision about what we were going to do, um, I was driving to work, and there's all these military vests, and they had all these signs, and they was like, oh, I think they said, fuck Michael Bender or some shit like that. And so, this, is, this is like the day after. This is the day after, you all so had, I'm driving, I'm like, well, yeah. We should, say, we should like, just let, clarify for folks what you all had done. Because it was yeah. momentous, right? This was like right after Charlottesville, right? Yeah, yeah. We had just, so. like, a lot of us had took a knee. We oh, took a seat. We were sitting down. We didn't take a knee. We were sitting down. It was like maybe like 15, 20 of us. And so, and, you know, they were talking. I guess they said I was the one who inspired it, but I was like, don't say that, you know? <laughs> but then, um, so I was driving to work, and, and like I said, it was a sign that said, it literally said, fuck Michael Bennett. And it was like, there was these white guys. There was military vests, and they were saying all this different stuff. And I thought they... I, I think they thought that I wouldn't stop or they didn't know if I would pass by. So I literally parked my car and I got out. And they, they probably thought it was going to be like this big black guy who's going to be really violent and all these different things. And I was mm. like, and, and I, I went and have a conversation with him. I was like, so let me hear, let me hear why you think this is wrong and what I'm, why you think that we're, the stance that we're taking is un-American and unpatriotic. So he goes into this whole spiel about this and that in the military. And I said, wait, you know, my dad was in the military. My uncle was in the military. My whole family served in the military. And he was like, oh, I, I didn't know that. I was like, obviously you didn't know that because you didn't research. And then so <laughs> he goes on and he starts to talk about the military vet. And I said, you know what, as, a, as me, I can never understand what it's like to be a military vet. And I don't try to. The difference is that you're trying to understand what it is to be a black man. Mm -hmm. And so he was like... I was like, I'm not saying that you have to agree with everything, I, what I'm saying, but you have to be able to have some empathy and listen to the stories and think about from a position, you know, whenever there's a shooting that happens or something happens with police and a person, uh, a black male or a woman or a Latino, people go, they pick sides, they say, well, I'm on the police side, I believe that we should be policed. And somebody will say, well, I believe she's a victim, and, but nobody ever thinks about the family. Mm -hmm. Like, what kind of trauma does that happen to a family when they lose a mother or they lose a sister. I've been in those rooms when I've talked to, you know, the, the mother or the son or the, the daughter of the person who's been slain and the pain that that person feels, you can't even say anything to them because you can't even say, I, I, I think I understand because you can't. You don't know what it feels like to lose a person like that. And I wanted to tell him, like, you don't understand what it feels like to wake up in a world as a black male or, or a black person and see everything about your existence is, is not pure. Like, what does it feel like to be, you look to tell your daughter that her life matters, but then when you turn on TV, somebody's slaying. How can you explain that to your child? Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to convey that message to him. And I think I really, we did a great job of, of, of agreeing. And, um, and to what you were saying about uh, politics and everything, and I believe, honestly, I believe it really starts in the school. You know, I teach black history at my daughter's school, and the reason why I teach black history is because 
I teach it because I want the other kids to understand the history of somebody so they can have a sense of respect for their contribution to America. And I think a lot of times in society, we don't have that in the schools anymore where people don't learn about the things that Native Americans country contributed to America, the things that Asian people contrib could contribute to America, Latin people. And I think if we had a sense of that at a young age, because it's really the only thing that we all do as a child, we all go to school. And so this is the perfect place to you know, really teach that. And not in the sense of like, oh, this person's better than that person, but in the sense of understanding what it is for somebody to go through or what they, how they really helped America. When I say that, you know, when Angela Rice said, we built this shit, she, that's, that's the, when Angela says that, it's the truth. We did build America, the things that we did. And, and to have somebody understand that, it just helps them have a better sense of the person and what they've been through and their, their, their journey through America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm wondering if you all could tell me a little bit about risk. Um, oh, we got questions coming in? Okay. I also don't know what, how much more time I have. She's not, she's not. F 15? Okay, cool. Um, so let me ask this one time about, about risk. Um, because it seems like the other thing that, that we need to do in this particular moment is, is to take risks, such as you, you're stopping here at the gate to talk with people who are saying, fuck Michael Bennett, mm -hmm. right? And, and all of you are facing risk. I, I imagine that writing about Dylan Roof, that that got, that got a, whole, a whole lot of backlash for you on the net. Uh, no? No, it did. Good. Well, that's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. I'm not but online. So. You're not online? <laughs> <laughs> you're on Instagram. It's an awesome account. But, uh, My 200 followers, you just you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more me. like 200,000, but hey. Um, but let's talk about risk. Like, what do you think we need to risk in this particular moment in order for us to be able to move through this particular moment as artists, as people working in the culture? I think... I think our pride, I think we need to risk our pride. I think a wow. pride is something that holds us back to being able to come talk to somebody and have that conversation before we resort to violence or we resort to something that's, you know. And I think me as a male, that's something that I feel like that happens a lot with males. We're so prideful that we don't even want to open up or have that vulnerability that you were speaking about. And I think that's super important for as a male to really, you know, share that with younger males so they can have that idea of what a man looks like. I think a man is changing so much since the beginning of time and now it's coming to the point where we can cry, we can do all these things and I think pride has held us back from having those conversations when we disagree with somebody and instead of resorting to killing somebody, you know, why can't we just have a conversation and move on? I think pride is one of the things that's really holding America back because we're so prideful to really think that we're the only country that didn't have a dirty history or a dirty laundry and it's the, the, the honesty of it, we've done everything that every other country has done but we just, since we just paint a better picture of it and make people understand it a little bit different and I think if we can have that pride you know, they talk about reparations and all these different things but at the same time it's like we got to have that pride to have that true conversation and let our guard down to really have the empathy and compassion for what happened to people around us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rachel, Damien. Yeah the question was what do we have to risk? Risk. I think we have to risk feeling more empowered to imagine that these institutions are not everlasting mm -hmm. and that they don't always have our best interests at heart and that we can call them out for that. Um, and that it's really important not to want to be inside of them for all the perfection, like the protection they afford us, you know, at the risk of giving up our voice, giving up our autonomy, giving up our values. Um, I went to go see Horton Spiller speak Mm -hmm. And she said this brilliant thing that, you know, family is a tricky word. Sometimes when we want to insert ourselves into belonging and kinship, we're asked to sacrifice things or do things that we actually don't think are our integrity, are, are part of our, like, integral being. And I think in the past, I think there was a time where I thought it was more important to be a part of, you know, a certain organization or this or that. And, and I think what I realized in the last few years is that when I stepped outside of them and said, I'm going to write what I want to really write, 
whether or not they believe these ideas are real or not is where I really obtained my strength and also like my, my, my sort of like authorial power. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's, there's nothing that, that can be gained from sacrificing what's really important in order to fit neatly into something that's melting away, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her lot of mm. That was so gorgeous. Yeah. That's true. Um, and your piece on Dylan Roof was incredible. It was incredible. My first answer when you asked that question was, I don't know. I don't know what's needed right now, what we need to risk. And that is actually what I think we need to risk, is saying, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like we... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like... Um, I feel like at times we're responding to this pressure and the pressure is about, I don't know, po popularity and media and pressures that aren't necessarily intrinsic to what our human need is. What our human need, our, 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 our need for connection is demanding and asking us. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we were able to stand, you know, the. The thing about white supremacy and white supremacist group, I was, um, I was at the Facing Race conference, and the last session that was, that was at the panel, uh, one of the speakers on it said, you know, I've been spending a lot of time in chat rooms for you know, white supremacist groups all over That's the world. Right. Yeah. And she said there was one thing that connected them, and it wasn't hatred, it wasn't shared philosophy, it wasn't just rage and anger, it was belonging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like a light bulb went off. Mm. And I don't know how to stand in a room with someone who was a proclaimed white supremacist. I don't know how to say, how do we be together? How are we going to be together? Yeah. I don't know. But what I can guess is that exactly what was true for Dylan is true for a lot of people, that there's a root that's been cut. I know that that's what I watched and with my colleagues who were in AWARE in this anti-racist um, group in LA who were very courageously taking on their own history. That's what they were doing, was going back to when that route was cut and trying to figure out where the trauma was in their own lines, in their own, their own lineage. I don't know how to say, I don't know, but I think if we don't say, I don't know, we're never gonna get there. We're never gonna move past a certain place. <laughs> So I, I don't know what those spaces look like to be able to say that, but I'm in feverish search of them and commitment to creating them where I can. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this question is from the audience and it actually follows really nicely from, uh, this, from what you just said, Alian. What are the rituals and ceremonies that each of you practice around this work of belonging, for this work of belonging? Hmm. I don't know if I have exact rituals and practices. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family. Mm -hmm. And that is, I guess, in a, in a, in a sense, a practice. Sure. Um, especially as I, as, as this more public space has become more of my reality. Um, I think that is, yeah, I think that is, because there is something about sitting across from your 92-year-old Chinese grandmother, you know, <laughs> being the daughter of an immigrant, mm -hmm. um, spending time with my dad who has uh, Parkinson's and dementia, and that being my route to Alabama, mm -hmm. and my route to being from the South. So I think that's my current practice is rooting myself with my family as much as I possibly can. I'm very blessed to live in LA where they all live, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Can we say smoking weed? Is that still? Can you say what? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> 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 nah, I'm just joking. No, <laughs> <laughs> <Nah, laughs> nah, I agree with her too. I think, I think family too. I think uh, being able. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 for real, though, I do think, uh, although smoking weed is not bad. Is that bad, why you're tired? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, 
for me, I think this is Amsterdam, <laughs> so it's all yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> We're no, in but, California, so yeah, yeah uh, you know, we Cali. Yeah, I agree with her. I think family too. I think when you look at when I look at my daughters, I I, I connect with them and I look at what they're going to be, you know, and what type of world they're going to be in. And, and whenever I come home and I feel that love and that from my wife and my children, I think that's what keeps me grounded and, and keeps me belonging. That's really my r- ritual. I try to be, every time I wake up when I kiss my wife, I try to be in that moment of like, this is the most important time, that kiss or that hug. And those are the rituals that I try to be in is trying to be in the now and every single thing that I do. Don't let my mind think about something else when I'm in that moment. So whenever I give her that kiss or that hug, it's really it's really a kiss or a hug. It's not just a, a habit like, oh, bye. It's like, yeah. no, this is the essence of like everything. Like the, you are my everything and this is my everything. And I think that's important to have that to uh, keep keep going. I think I read this one thing where you had said... If I win a game, I go home and watch a movie with my daughters. If I lose a game, I go home and watch a movie with my daughters. Yeah. Yeah? Because yeah? my daughters are everything. I think, you know, as, as I talk about my book, you know, I, obviously I grew up as a male. So I never really, and my, I had a lot of brothers too, so I never really had like an like a understanding of what it's like to be around women all the time. And now that I'm... A, a father of three daughters, it's like, I'm like, dang, this is, this is beautiful to be in the, um, the sea. Like, you know, whenever one, one of my daughters says something like, oh, only a man can do that. And then my other daughter says, that's not true. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like they're, you know, they're building their own camaraderie and their own strength and to watch that happen as a father and not, and still challenge myself as a man to be able to you know, have a conversation with my daughter, like, okay, let me have a conversation with her. I don't know, as a man, I'm like, oh, if I'm talking to a son, I'm like, oh, I know exactly what to say. But when I'm talking to my daughter, it makes me have to listen. Mm-hmm. And then I can't talk until after she's done talking because I have to understand what she's saying. So I think for me, he's done a great job of well rounding me out as a person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rachel, yeah. Yeah, practices, think, rituals? I mean, my job is to listen to other people talk. Mm. Um, and so it's been very helpful in the sense that I don't feel a great sense of unwavering authority. Um, and I think the thing that I've been trying to do of late is to not let these sort of political circumstances, these external circumstances threaten and sort of alter the values that I've held for most of my life. And so I had friends say, you know, like, I can't deal with certain people anymore, you know, after this election, da da da. And I think that is one way to sort of like retreat into the self and and the things where I can have the easiest conversations. Mm -hmm. So I've had to really actively say, I'm not going to be defeated in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to keep listening and I'm going to keep engaging. But I'm also going to keep speaking and like saying what I think. You know, so if I'm talking to someone who has a completely um, controversial or offensive point of view to me and I'm listening to them talk, I, I want to listen, but I also want to be able to say, well, this is why I think what you're saying troubles me mm-hmm. um, and not feel that I, I have to be silent in order to, to get along. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's engagement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's giving the other person some room yeah. and some respect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you all have talked about, there's another question from the audience. Thank you, audience. You all have talked about intersectionality in one way or another. What are some challenges you've encountered, and what do you do to navigate that? Challenges with intersectionality? Mm-hmm. In terms of trying to practice, I guess, intersectionality. I sort of want to ask that person, what do you mean? Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up, what do you mean? I know, I know. I, I, Who is there anybody? I'm sure the person's in the audience. They don't exist. Be a nail. No? Okay. I think personally for me, oh, like, sorry. I understand, I mean, for me, what I understand from that question is like, it's like when I first started talking about Black Lives Matter, right? And I was thinking about it as from one perspective, like, uh, just police brutality, black lives, like this is it. But then I had to understand like as a black male to talk about trans or like lesbian or, you know, is, you don't talk about that. And how do you support that 
as a man and you're, and you're in the black community without seeing and being somebody being like, well, why are you supporting that? But then my whole thought about intersectionality is that like this person's life matters regardless of it is, and that's a black life, regardless of gender, whatever they choose is theirs and to support that. And that's for me was like my first, another step into my understanding of, of that whole thing was like, okay, how do I understand that and have so much respect for the person because of they are brave enough to live in their truth. And that was something that I had to learn as a, as a male growing up in like, in this society, especially when it, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I will say about that? I feel like the greatest challenges I've had about intersectional, intersectionality or is, is within myself. Mm -hmm. That, that's what I feel. It, it hasn't been like outer experiences with one community or another, or something happened or an event, whatever. It's been re reconciling being at that intersection, holding space for the tension at times. It's been very interesting since the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement. I'm finding myself I remember at the end of last year, I, really, I was really debating whether or not this was sort of gonna be it for me in terms of acting because I just felt like all of, all of the stuff came out of the pot after Harvey and after all the stuff that you know, was a part of the Me Too movement. And it felt like, I don't wanna put it back. I don't wanna put it back, but I don't know how committed everyone is, not just for the, the gender equity issues and the sexual harassment and sexual assault issues, but also for the, the uh, reality of stories that do not center people of color. And, and like how, are we as committed to fighting for everyone's mm -hmm. truth and everyone's story and everyone's voice? Mm -hmm. And I'm just feeling like, God, I just feel like a sales girl at a white supremacist convention. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's what I feel like all the time. Um, and so I feel like it's in myself that I've been most deeply making space for um, the intersection of multiple things. It hasn't been issues, you know what I mean? It hasn't been in community. It's really been within myself. Mm. Mm -hmm. Rachel? I'm gonna keep thinking about it. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, so time for round robin. I throw out a word or a phrase and only one of you gets to answer, but you just jump in, react to it, give us your answer, okay? Uh, okay. This word, which uh, you used, actually, in, in your speech. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tethering. Yeah. I just Tethering. think it's dope that that word's coming back because of, because of Jordan Peele. Tethering. No? Anybody? You brought Tethering? that back? I thought I brought that back. You brought that back? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Tom Brady's hair. Tom Brady's hair. Is this real? This is real. <laughs> We're doing the round robin Wait, right can now. Wait, can we pick them up or once they're out, they're gone? Can they're we just, out like, and you just like, somebody's got to, this, obviously this one's for you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> is there another Michael Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, Nipsey Hussle. Mm. Um, That's hard. Have, did you know him? Because I want. No, to, I, didn't, I didn't know him. I didn't know him, mm -hmm. and I, I can't speak to um, to to his his death uh, from a place of either knowing him or his music very well. Like that's just the truth. Um, but as someone from South LA, that was like it was surreal and painful in a way that's hard to articulate. Mm -hmm. It's also complicated. Um, I saw this article that I can't remember who wrote, but they were talking about this complicated grief because uh, he was not uh, without his own journey, his own evolution when it came to LGBTQ issues, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard to imagine um, you know, being from South LA, but maybe being trans, maybe being, you know, identifying with the LGBTQ community and having this pull of someone who was 
doing something unprecedented, making tech cool, making something that, that we, we, we don't, we're not seeing as, oh, we have agency in this, in this location. And he made it like, no, you should go after this. Um, that was hard. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah for me, I, I, I listened to Nipsey Hussle music for so long, so, you know, it was painful for me because, and I've, you know, being here, you, when artists die or something, it's not very often that I feel like I'm so affected by, by it. And I feel like this was the f first time in a long time that I felt like I was affected by it because to me it was like, he was giving everything to his community and it's like, he died in the same community from something that we always talk about, gun violence or, or toxic, toxic masculinity. When I think about the guy, I could have just walked away. But the impact that he was having, it was just like, to me, it was bigger than Tupac because, you know, Tupac talked about a lot of things, but he didn't have all this action that Nipsey Hussle was having. He had so much action, the things he was doing, you know, giving people jobs out of prison, you know, uh, parks, technology, all these different things that he was doing and finding his voice and having that impact. And for other people, I mean, you look at the impact of his death and look how many people stood up for him and, and watching the Bloods and Crips come together, like, mm -hmm. that's not... That doesn't happen very often. That's right. Yeah. You know, watching all these different people come to his, come to his, uh, his death and be like, and, sh and something come out of it, and people are doing positivity. I think so. It was hard for me to see something like his death happen, and it was just overwhelming for me just to know that somebody was doing so much for the community and died at such a young age, and it's just, it, and the way he died was just like, I could never picture him dying like that from something like that and I just it was just overwhelming for me man just to be and, and all my friends that's all we talked about for a week I couldn't even sleep for like the whole week because every day I was like why I couldn't understand why it happened I was constantly looking up things on every single platform Google being every single thing trying to figure out is it more than what they just said Kitty is this just it this can't be just the reason why this man left the earth because it's more that he can give and what he was given and so for me I was really impacted as a person that's in the spot like and, and, and giving back to the community, it just, it just, it just touched me. It touched my heart personally. Mm. We have time for just one last quick question here, uh, and it, yeah. So in this moment, what what gives you hope? What gives you hope to keep on going? Well, that we've been in worse circumstances before and prevailed. Mm. Mm. And so for me, I feel very relieved writing a book of history because at every moment there's a sort of intervention of, wow, things have been very bleak, they've been very grim, and we have changed the world multiple times mm. as black people mm. in our search for freedom and our resistance to injustice, and we will do it again. And so I don't, this, it's very temporary, any sort of like existential angst I have about Right now, it's, yeah. right now is just one more, you know, one more sort of like gulf that we'll wade through. I think mm -hmm. for me too, um, two things that kind of give me hope. Um, I was in, I was in Haiti, and my friend, or my, or my best friend, he's played with me. And he built, he's from Haiti, and he builds schools, and it's this particular school that he built, and it's across a, it's across a river, and and just his brother and these two brothers and. Um, they walked 10 miles to go to school every day. And um, one of the brothers drowned in, in, in the river. And, um, and when he built the bridge, the kids kept going to school. So for me to see like all the things that they're going through and to see that they constantly are pushing for it to have a change, it was really powerful for me, for me and overwhelming. And it was similar to the same thing that happened to me in Senegal. Me and my wife, we um, work with a, a whole bunch of girls in Senegal, and they were having these these problems with massive rapes, and and and, and to and so we were sitting at this table with a round table of these brilliant girls. Like I can't even, I can't even like fathom what they was going through, and to see the power, and 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 their voice. And one of the girls, I asked her, I said, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And she said, "I want to be a." a police woman so I could stop the rapes. And then another woman says, another young girl said, I want to be a doctor because 
all these, and I wanted to create this app because so many people are dying because they get to the hospital and there's nothing. They don't know how to like, you know, put them in a system and they're dying in the waiting office in the lobby. And to like hear two young people have an issue what's happening in their country and to have a way to solve their problem, it just gave me so much hope to see and look into their eyes and I can just see the hope and resilience of people regardless of you know, their circumstances. People are survivors and I think for me that gave me a lot of hope to know that these young kids are the people who are gonna be leading the future and I, I, I look, I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. My dad gives me hope. Mm -hmm. My dad, uh, I have this very complicated relationship with my dad. Um, he's something of my muse in my work and in my life. Um, you know, he is from the South, from Alabama. And when I've asked about growing up in Alabama, he does not offer much the sort of one story he keeps coming back to is, let me tell you this. The sheriff of our county was the head of the KKK. And then he just like sits. And I think about both before and after him. I think about all that it took for him to exist. All that survival all of that um, human will <laughs> and then spiritual rootedness to survive. And then I think about his grandkids and him being able to now watch them. He now lives with my brother and he's able to watch them and he's teaching them to play chess. My brother's teaching them to play chess. My dad taught my brother. So they're all, they all now have to play chess. And my nieces, um, she was describing, my, my brother was sort of testing her about the chess pieces on the board, and, uh, and he said, well, who's the, what's the most important piece, the most valuable piece, the most important piece on the, on the chess board? And she said, well, in this game, it's the king, but in real life, it's the queen. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm watching him watch her, and there's something about seeing my dad having moved and come from a legacy of survival and having <laughs> married a Chinese woman uh, and, and watching these kids shift the narrative that really hadn't shifted before them. Something about that gives me hope. Something about that says there's a moment after this moment. Something about that says, um, even in the moment that you find yourself in, he could not have known at 12 years old with the head of, with the sheriff of his county being the head of the KKK that he would be in this moment. Mm. He couldn't have known. Mm -hmm. So that gives me hope. Mm. There's something about the truth of, um, the truth that's beyond this moment. Well, your work gives us hope. So thank you for that. Please join me in thanking Rachel Kajigansa, John Leon Gardner, Michael Bennett. Just so sitting that. between two like me. Uh, Once more for our amazing panelists are gonna keep their seats for a moment, as will you. They want Jesus. you to keep your seats on stage. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> they're going to take, take pictures of you ah, in, okay. a, in a sly way. How you guys doing out there? <laughs> Day one Othering and Belonging Conference. I moved from when I stepped first into the room. I thank you guys for being part of that movement, and hopefully you feel affected as well. I was told there'd be screens on the side that tell us amazing things about tomorrow's schedule. So I just <laughs> want to remind you that breakfast, the most important meal of the day, starts at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Tomorrow, wow. we'll be right near here. Also at eight o'clock, the Omi Gallery will open. At nine o'clock in this room, I will be here to join you. 
I will greet you. I will welcome you to your Tuesday. I can't wait to see your beautiful faces. Nine o'clock in this room tomorrow. And then we have a, just an amazing repertoire of things that are going to be available to you tomorrow. And I think we're going to move through these slides rather quickly so you can see that. We have a 9.15 session, our 9.45 session. Can we have the next slide, please? Oh, at 10.45 all the way to 3 o'clock. Check out all the amazing offerings. But just a reminder that we are back in this room tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We want to thank you sincerely for being here. We want to thank our amazing Dion Decibels DJ over on one side. I want to remind you that these things don't power themselves, that there are a crew of people working for our conference and for the hotel. And as we're talking about othering and belonging, remember to show gratitude to the domestic workers who will see your rooms over the next few days. Remember to show gratitude for the people powering all your meals and all your food. We want to be inclusive in this community. And I want to remind you that at 6 o'clock this evening, 6 o'clock this evening, which is like in like right now o'clock, you can like use the bathroom and then go get your book signed after you buy a book from Michael Bennett, who is selling books in the lobby. And the title of the book is Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. I just thought he might look up while I say it, but that's how smooth he is. He like, give me out this small chair. So... Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Othering Belonging Conference. Do good things for yourself today. Hydrate, sleep. Be back in this room tomorrow at 9 a.m. for more transformation. Thank you so much. And thank you again to our amazing panelists, to Michael, to Don Leon, to Rachel, and to the unstoppable Jeff Chang. Thank you so much. Don't be afraid to dance while you leave. When am I performing? This is my performance. All day, every day, I hold space with you. Thank you.